Great responsibility. I've heard it comes with great power. Never better is that personified than in Marvel's Spider-Man. The core theme of this story is relearning what you do with such a responsibility when the weight of the world is placed upon your shoulders, when your struggles and the struggles of everyone around you become a deeply personal battle. This concept and the themes surrounding it are interwoven with every character, every arc, and the core plot of the game in such a way that I didn't even notice until I replayed it for this video. Marvel's Spider-Man from 2018 is a marvel in and of itself. The point of this game comes down to that one simple Spider-Man premise. With great power comes great responsibility. A line from Uncle Ben that defines who Peter becomes, and in a story set eight years after that event took place, where Peter knows what it means to be Spider-Man, how do you even begin to explore that or challenge that? How do you tell a new Spider-Man story without retreading his origin whilst also having the central themes be at its core, with great power comes great responsibility. How do you successfully achieve the rebirth of Spider-Man? There was supposed to be an ad here. Um, sadly though, the sponsor pulled out. So, I thought I'd take a second just to plug my Patreon. If you like what I make, and you'd like to support me a little bit further, you can do with the link in the description. There's tons of exclusive content, early access, blah blah blah. Check it out if you're interested, I won't waste your time. But a big thank you to my Patreon producers that are helping support me. We've got Cabbage, Ethan, Arenathon, Callum Thefmas Kelly, Conocido Sam, Damien the Not So Orange Gnome, Flash Paradox, Luke Pierce, Nathan L. Garcia, Rollins, and TJ. Thank you all so much for your continued support, on with the video. A lone spider hanging from a web as the out of focus New York skyline sits behind it. That's how we open Marvel Spider-Man, a perfect representation of what this character is in a lot of ways. The spider is horribly realistic in the remaster, which is the version I played for this video. Also, I still hate that the Freedom Tower was changed to be some, just some random glass tower. Like, it really doesn't matter, but it, God, it, it bothers me. It looked so good in that first reveal trailer. As the camera pans around the room of this apartment, we see photos. Peter and his friends, Uncle Ben and Aunt May, a police radio, comic books, more photos, science equipment, suit designs and web shooters, jars of spare change Peter has been saving probably for months, his mask, and then newspaper clippings to remind Peter what he can do, the change he can have and why he remains Spider-Man, even when it gets tough. And a final lingering shot of a ton of sticky notes, tons of things to remember and catch up on, but at the same time, the phone buzzes, crime in progress, waking Peter from his sleep, and in a matter of moments he's leapt up, grabbed a quick bite, put on his suit, keeping the classic style suit for the opening is such a clever move, and he's ready to drop everything to swing into action, to catch Wilson Fisk, a man he's been after for years, and just as he's about to leap through the window, a letter is passed under his door. He's late on bills, but in classic Spider-Man fashion, that's gonna have to wait. He dives through the window and swings into action, chasing the helicopter as alive by warbly jets blares out on his way to catch Wilson Fisk. This opening tells us everything we need to know about this character to begin this story. It conveys his history, the important things, his friends and family, but most importantly it conveys the duality of Peter's life, the most integral part of a Spider-Man story, two lives constantly at odds. This short shot of him glancing at the letter to his scanner and then back again, stepping toward the letter before turning and diving through the window is perfect. It's subtle, it's reserved, but it says everything we need to know about this character and how torn he can feel. He's not a billionaire playboy, he's not a well-known hero celebrity, he's not an agent on a payroll, he's just a regular guy who puts on a mask and saves people. Spider-Man to me and to a lot of people is THE hero, doing what he does every day without thanks and sacrificing so much to do it all, and that's all conveyed through the short, sweeping shot of his apartment. It's... marvellous. Although, look, 
let's just get it out of the way at like the top of the video here. Let's let's talk about the fa the face. I can't make a Spider-Man video and not talk about Peter Parker's face change. I, I have to do it. My thoughts on this fall somewhere in the middle of the aisle. I don't think the new Peter looks bad. I, I really don't. And the character is conveyed by motion capture and Yuri Lowenthal. So in the way of character, you don't actually lose much by changing the face model. However, it irks me not because I think the old face was better, which is weird, like, it's someone's real face. Why are we ranking who looks better? No, the reason it bothers me is because it shows a lack of artistic integrity. Why did Peter look this way in the original? Was it totally incidental? Obviously not, they, they made a choice to have him look like this. Character design is as important to a character as performance and writing, and all of that is conceived together, not in a vacuum. For example, take Sonic the Hedgehog. His silhouette is iconic, and it informs part of his character. I talk about this in my video on the original Sonic the Hedgehog game. He's designed to look a certain way because it helps inform the way his character is conveyed to an audience. And that continued into the games which had actual writing and voice acting. The same applies to a character like Peter Parker. His character, the way he sounds, looks, and is written were all conceived together, and so the original design for this character is how the character was envisioned when they made the game. If the faces were swapped and the new one was the original and the original was the new one, I'd feel the same way about it. The original version was their vision and is integral to the character. Changing it just feels like a, a, a lack of care for the integrity of the artistic vision, or that it lacks artistic vision at all. I'm aware I'm probably overanalyzing this, but I mean, it's kind of what I do. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, and I already said, like, I don't, I don't think it even looks bad, but I can't help but feel like it would be incredibly weird if they, like, altered Joel from The Last of Us to look more like Troy Baker, or changed Kratos to look more like Chris Jones. Their character designs are part of who they are. Just changing them is really weird to me on a conceptual level. I don't think the new face for Peter looks bad like a lot of people do. He looks fine, he looks like Peter Parker, but I can't help but feel the choice was made for ease of creating better facial animations at the cost of an artistic vision, which to me, on a creative level, I find more valuable. Spider-Man makes his way to Fisk Tower. This is where we get to see a greater sense of where Peter is at at this point in his life. The game simply allows us to absorb who he is through what is essentially a slice of life before the story they're about to tell actually picks up, although this mission is the catalyst for that story. As Alive by the Warbly Jets fades out, a perfect introduction song, we get on a call with Yuri Watanabe, a police captain in New York City and someone Spider-Man is very close to, and an important character within this narrative. They've been working together, clearly for a while, and this mission to take down Fisk is the culmination of a lot of work. Eight years, Peter says. This sequence is just such a way to start your game. The swing to Fisk Tower as your first web connects to a building and you feel the momentum pull you along. The first taste of combat that will become so much deeper by endgame. The game is just teasing you. Making your way through Fisk Tower, the game takes its time to introduce a lot of the main gameplay mechanics. Gone are the days of Bruce Campbell telling you how to press the jump button, although I, I do yearn for it. This game teaches you everything you need to know just by having you do it. The same way it allows you to absorb the story, you absorb the fundamentals of gameplay too. Your basic attacks, web strikes, dodges, and gadgets, along with a few different enemy archetypes that'll be expanded as the game goes on. A lot of people don't give this game the credit for how it manages to keep the world and your gameplay opportunities expanding right up until the credits roll. Maybe not as expertly done as God of War 2018, but done nonetheless, and in an open world, that can often be difficult to do. Too many games want to give you all of the stuff at once, but Spider-Man shows patience and restraint. Drip feeds you new things, so you always feel like there's something to work for. I like that, but we'll talk more about it in detail later on. This mission feels like the culmination of something we weren't privy to, yet also we don't need to be for this to work. You become invested in how much Peter is invested, making your way through the building, climbing through the vents, stopping the men with rocket launchers while trying to juggle a call with Aunt May. Hi, Aunt May. What is all that noise? Hostiles, next floor up. Watching a superhero movie. What's up? I just wanted to make sure we're still on for dinner tomorrow night. Totally. Uh, listen, I gotta go. Breaking into the server room, downloading important data just in time, and battling with Fisk himself at the end in a boss fight that lets you feel powerful and is so, so Spider-Man. Uh, you do know I can still see you, right? Eight years of this insolence. This whole mission feels like what could have been the final mission in a game set before this one, which 
is what makes it the perfect introduction to this game. But once Fisk has been dealt with, once he's in cuffs and off to prison, he says something that in a lot of ways rings true for the game to come. Fisk was easy compared to what takes place next. I'm the one who kept order in this city! One month! In one month you wish you had me back! Following this, it's time to catch up on what's happening in Peter's life. He's called into work for an equipment check before the arrival of the grant committee to continue their research. Upon arriving at the lab, we get what is one of the coolest reveals, at least it was at the time, not knowing he would be in the game of Otto Octavius. You started without me. The grant committee's director will be here soon. It's fine, Parker. I invented this equipment. I think I can handle it. The usage of the wires forming what look like tentacles is so clever. It's not subtle, but there's something about it being so earnest. It's not played as a joke or a reference or a wink to the audience. It's just such a genuine piece of foreshadowing within the story. It takes itself seriously with it. He will become Doc Ock. It's inevitable, and that adds tension for the player every time we see this character. Every time we see a positive interaction, every time he thanks Peter, every time Peter praises his intelligence, we know what's coming, what was always going to happen, and that keeps you on the edge of your seat, and you watch it play out yet can't do anything about it. I'll have more to say about Otto as the game goes on, but this introduction is pretty much flawless. The machine he's testing malfunctions. Otto says no to turning off the machine, he's clearly desperate for whatever he's working on, but it's more so than just passion, it's personal. Peter has to take matters into his own hands and disable the machine to save Otto. Peter has to come to the rescue, which is great foreshadowing too for what will happen by the end in his futile attempt to save the man that he cares for deeply. Otto refuses to help himself, so Peter is forced to do what he has to do. When the Grant Committee arrives, they're not best pleased by the smoke and mess created by Otto's machine. This works as a way to establish and then reinforce Otto being on the back foot. He's kind of downtrodden, trying his best to do what's right and help people who've lost limbs. The reason Peter joined him in the first place, yet is struggling to get it right or to get the funds that he needs. One of the many reasons for his eventual fall from grace. What we do know about these two at this stage though is that Peter is devoted to Otto and their research and that Otto deeply values Peter. We learn as much through one of the voice notes in the lab. Today's the day. Grant review. We're ready. The work has progressed at a remarkable pace. I honestly never thought we'd get the tensile actuator back to an acceptable tolerance. But Parker, the boy has an eye for guerrilla science like none other. Just as I was ready to order a custom machine replacement part, he returned from the hardware store with a bottle of solvent and a toothbrush. Bang! Actuator problem resolved. The boy is a genius. A chronically late genius. It's already ten after. Where is he? Surely he couldn't have forgotten today's review. Sorry I let you down, Doc. I, I do wish people just left voice notes lying around in their home like they do in Spider-Man. Just like, little bits of info so you can learn more about them as people. You just pop round for a cup of tea and on the kitchen table is a hulking great tape recorder with basic information about the person recorded on it, specifically for you. I, I think the world would be a better place if such things were a reality. This is also where we're introduced to Peter Parker Science minigames, which I, I promptly turned off. I, I skipped every single one. I'm not here to divert power on a mini circuit or whatever the fuck. I, I get what they were going for here and what they were trying to do to give us things to do as Peter and not just Spider-Man, but I got infinitely more valuable Peter gameplay out of just wandering feast than having optional dialogue or the voice notes in the lab. I, I didn't ever at any point feel like I needed to solve a really boring puzzle to connect more with Peter Parker. There were probably better ways to incorporate Peter's smarts into Spider-Man work. It wouldn't have even been that bad if they'd had like one of these, or two, but it just happens so frequently, it's like, I'm, I'm over it, I'm, I don't need it. The suit Peter has been using for the first part of the game seems to probably be the same suit he's used for the last eight years, with some modifications here and there. With it being torn up in the fight against Fisk, 
He opts to make a new suit, which of course makes sense given this is a new take on Spider-Man. Whilst tethering it to what we know, Insomniac then uses that as a springboard to catapult us into their vision of Spider-Man. This suit is a suit I remember being apprehensive of when it was first shown off. The white spider was so strange and different at the time. I remember the discourse around it being divisive, a lot of people saying, why didn't they just make the spider black? It would have been a hundred times better. But this suit looks great. Like, really, really great. It's one of my favourite Spider-Man designs. It's so dynamic and angular. I just think it looks fantastic. The one caveat to this, though, is that the, the suit's kind of orange, isn't it? Oh, okay, not completely orange, but like... I mean, it, it is orange. Especially when you compare it directly to the Spider-Man Homecoming suit, which is very much red. Thankfully, they seem to have fixed this in Spider-Man 2, which is a huge W for Insomniac, I will say. And I can't talk about the suit without talking about all of the suits that are in Spider-Man PS4. Insomniac put in so many suits from across all of Spider-Man canon and ones that they came up with themselves specifically for this game. I really like the way they're integrated into the progression system. You unlock them by spending tokens that you gain by completing side activities in the world. So as you engage with the gameplay of Spider-Man, you unlock really tangible, rewarding rewards because it's really cool to unlock and even just collect the different suits. Even if you don't like how the suit looks, and I will admit a lot of them I don't really love actually using, I tend to not even change the suit out of the main suit if I'm doing a proper replay of the game, although I will say some of the movie inspired suits are pretty cool, they all have their own abilities, so it's worth unlocking a suit so that you can get a particular ability. And by a particular ability, what I mean is once you get the spider bro, use that and never change it because it's fucking so overpowered. I would sit here and break down every single suit ability, but that is just boring, I think, personally. So I'm not going to do that. And people have already done it. Who cares? Let's just move on. Having the new suit also be designed in a sense by Otto is pretty meaningful for the story, especially given Peter is instrumental in building the arms that become the main tools of destruction for Doc Ock later in the game. Both of them inform each other, and I think that's, like, really meaningful. Like, like not just narratively do they inform each other on, like, a thematic level, also, like, on an actual, like, contextual level where Peter is building the arms and then Otto is helping him with his suit, like, in the background, and, like, both of these things then cross over at the end with the with the new suit that ends up being what helps him defeat the, the arms and stuff. Look, we'll, we'll get onto all that stuff. I just think it's pretty cool. The scene prior to this, though, is important too. Before the creation of the suit, as he's working on it in the lab, Otto walks in with a Chinese takeaway. I think, right? I mean, that's a panda. The fat panda? If that's not Chinese takeaway, then I don't know what it is. What you got there? Chinese. Oh. I, I should really just let things play out, shouldn't I? Peter tries desperately to hide the suit, but Otto is far too clever. He can see what Peter is working on and puts it together pretty much instantly. I think on a replay, it's very clear Otto knows in this moment Peter is Spider-Man, but opts to pretend he didn't figure it out, saying, ah, I guess if you design his equipment, you're bound to be a target too. But, but I think he knows. This is where he figures it out and keeps it internalized until the very end, which causes our climactic final confrontation. Once out with our new suit, I think maybe it's time to go on patrol. The open world of New York City is incredible. The detail is like nothing I've ever seen and holds up years later. From the pedestrians to the traffic, the little effects in the environment, foliage, people on rooftops, the variety of buildings, fire escapes, the brickwork, the recreation of real world landmarks and Marvel landmarks, it's just incredible. Especially given how little time you'll actually spend standing on the ground or walking the streets, the details are wonderful, especially in sections where you're forced to walk the streets as Peter or later on as Miles to just soak in the atmosphere and ambience of the city that never sleeps. But more than likely, you won't really spend much time doing that. You'll be high in the sky, swinging between rooftops, and the different times of day that are baked into the game just allow for you to see the city in wholly new ways. I really like that there isn't a dynamic day and night cycle, that it allows for specific times of day to be used at points in the story and for them to be visually curated and executed to perfection. The sunset being one of the most iconic Spider-Man times of day, made all the more famous through the Raimi trilogy of films, makes swinging around the city feel impeccable, which as a movement mechanic is one of the best in all of fiction. The way Spider-Man gets around New York lends itself so perfectly to video games. 
Now, the most beloved for a long time was, of course, Spider-Man 2, a real physics-based web-swinging system, which is still remarkable to this day. Webs that actually attach to buildings, real momentum, and the ability to experiment with that. Spider-Man 2018 doesn't take as realistic an approach, but I do think for the most part, it's to the overall benefit of the traversal system. Spider-Man 2018 isn't totally automatic, but it isn't totally manual either. You press R2 to go, that's the go faster button. If you're on the ground, it lets you sprint and parkour across obstacles. If you jump, it'll launch you into a swing. If all you do is hold R2, you'll automatically shoot webs, swing, and release at the max height. You can play like this, but the optimal way isn't to play like this. If you press X while in a swing, you'll jump and boost from the web. If you do it at the right point, you can either send yourself flying higher to gain altitude or forwards to gain speed. Stringing this together with the web zips and point launches allows you to have a decent bit of autonomy when moving around the city. Of course, you can also run on walls, zip around corners, charge jump, and do this little quick recovery move. When you hit the floor, it lets you retain momentum and fling you back into the sky. The biggest criticisms I have of the system aren't how it plays or feels, because it feels great. The biggest issue I have is that it's a system you cannot fail. There is no skill involved to win. You will always recover and continue on. You can't fuck up. Which doesn't deny a flow state because you want to keep your momentum, but you can never truly lose it entirely unless you stop holding the controller, because if all you do is push forward and hold R2, you'll never fail. You'll just slow down sometimes, maybe. One of the things that made Spider-Man 2 so beloved was the fact that you could slam into the sides of buildings, you could hit the floor, you could really mess up. I would genuinely love to see more of that from Insomniac Spider-Man, the ability to get it wrong, even if it's just an option you can toggle so that by playing well, I feel even more rewarded. And Spider-Man 2 does have an option for fall damage that's turned on by default, so uh, that's a huge plus. The other criticism, I guess, is that the momentum feels false, like it's not real momentum. You can hit a certain speed and then you're at your max. It's, it's hard to really describe what I'm talking about, but in Spider-Man 2, it feels like the better you play, the faster and faster you can go, and it's rewarding. In Spider-Man 2018, it feels like you just gradually speed up to a max speed and then can't go any faster, no matter how well you play. I think the game has too many safety nets and automations that can, after hours and hours, make it feel a bit too safe and restrictive as a system. The things I'm talking about include the automatic web zips through different geometry, unless you're coming at it head on it feels like fake momentum because it's an automatic animation that doesn't flow from where you started the animation from. If you get too low to the floor in a swing that would otherwise slam you into the ground, you'll sort of weirdly hover above the floor into a higher swing to save you because you can't swing into the floor. The dive move, which is meant to grant speed boosts, can sometimes feel wrong as well, with it not granting the ample amount of speed and therefore feeling a little bit clunky as you release from your webline after a huge dive and don't see a significant speed boost. These really are only minor though, because usually the system works so perfectly that you don't notice, and it's something they only improved in the remaster and Miles Morales. So I I can only assume it feels even better in Spider-Man 2. And the system is loved for a reason, and it feels incredible. Every time I loaded the game up after some time away, just jumping from a rooftop with all the exaggerated swagger of a 23-year-old white man felt so spectacular, especially with the feedback on the dual sense. The traversal is so engaging that I'd often find myself not heading to the next mission. Instead, I'd take photos of the landmarks or just get one more backpack, which all give you nice poignant little pieces of information about Peter's life in the past eight years. One of my favorites was about his interview at Oscorp. He could have worked there and had better pay, but the work that Otto was doing is what ultimately stopped him. Peter's moral compass is integral to his character and also plays directly into his conflict with Otto and Otto's with Norman later in the game. The surveillance towers and the crimes just work themselves into a self-perpetuating harmonious loop of dopamine hits and I love that about it. The tasks in the world are so quick to complete and so satisfying to boot that you find yourself going from backpack to landmark to crime to surveillance tower. It's the same feeling you get if you're doom scrolling from Twitter to Instagram to TikTok. TikTok, just to block out the harsh reality of your real life, but in a, in a in a good in a good way, in a good way, not in a you know, 
Maybe that was a terrible analogy. There are other pillars of gameplay, but as to not completely front load this video, we'll come back to those elements as we go. All this while, as we've been fighting crime, swinging around the city and getting to know Otto, Peter has been planning a thank you party for Aunt May, who's been working at Feast for five years, spending all of her free time helping the people of the city who need it. Something that can be said for Peter as well in a different way. It's a great sequence. Peter trying to stop May from turning around and the cake being wheeled out. But the best bit is this little dialogue between Peter and May. These past few years, you helping me through college and working here, and sacrificing so much and asking for nothing. I just wish there were more people like you in the world. I used these exact words to describe what I feel towards Spider-Man earlier in this video, what makes a true hero. Aunt May is a hero to Peter, as much as Uncle Ben's death is a staple of what makes Peter Spider-Man, so is Aunt May's life. What she does, who she is, they're integral parts of forming Peter into the heroic and moral beacon that he is. Aunt May is so deeply important to this character story. We're also introduced to Martin Lee, someone we knew long before the release of the game would be a major antagonist, Mr. Negative. There'll be far more to explore with him later in the video, but for now, he is to May what Otto is to Peter. There's a stark parallel here that is explored more towards the end of the game. Two heroes in different ways, Peter and May having to come to terms with someone they saw as a moral light being twisted by darkness. Leaving the party because of a break-in at an auction house holding Fisk's estate sale, duty calls. No downtime for long. Upon arriving, we find masked men threatening the woman who I assume owns the auction house, or is at least the manager there or something. They're searching for something Fisk must have been hiding. Upon making our way through, we're introduced to the most basic stealth in the game. And by the most basic stealth in the game, I sort of mean the stealth is the most basic stealth in a game. Later on, things do get deeper, but never by much. The stealth is far more a means to an end than any sort of actual challenging gameplay loop. The guards don't have detection cones, once you're above them they cannot see you, and it's very, very hard to get detected. Even using your scan ability, the game will literally tell you when it is or isn't safe to silently take down a guard. This is baby's first stealth game. I want to dedicate a later portion of the video to discussing stealth more in depth, because there is more to it, and there are elements of great fun, but for now, this is just the basics. More importantly though, this is where we're introduced to Mary Jane Watson, a character who I love, and in this game, I continue to love. I think it's one of my favourite MJs in any Spider-Man thing, to be honest. However, the game does have us play as her multiple times, and every time, it's kind of the worst. And look, the thing is, the concept isn't bad, because I really like the one mission at the end in the Osborne penthouse. It's actually really great. You have enough abilities that you can choose how to deal with the situation, it's actually tense, it's a core story moment, you want to explore and learn more, but the rest of these... Ah, uh, nah, no thanks. The positive here though, I suppose, is that they start off bad, and they only get less bad, because each one introduces something new mechanically. But they're never genuinely good, other than that last one. But I, I honestly think I might have had Stockholm Syndrome by that point. From a purely narrative standpoint though, like I said, I love MJ in this game. I love that she and Peter stopped talking, not because they fell out of love, but because he wouldn't trust her enough to get involved in the hero work. I also love that the game doesn't play this as a totally wrong and bad decision from Peter, like it's some subconscious sexism, but a nuanced stance, one of care and love, and they both have to learn to see things from the other's perspective and work together as a team. I think it's really, really nice, and the way that MJ is written as confident and headstrong just adds to her character at this stage in Peter's life. They're really a perfect match in a lot of ways. Once dealing with everything at the auction house and moving on and meeting up with MJ at Mix, it's just a really, really nice, wholesome scene to see them reconnect in a way that feels almost like the first time again in a lot of ways, playing into that concept I talked about at the top of the video. This is an origin story without being an origin story. Peter and MJ fall for each other all over again. I also love this line from Peter talking to something I mentioned earlier, him choosing Otto over Oscorp. You know Oscorp would hire you in a heartbeat, right? One phone call to hair- Sure, but Dr. Octavius's work will help millions. I'm, I'm, I'm right where I want to be, right where I should be. Almost sounds like it's more important than your other job. And as Peter is saved by the sirens, MJ contemplates silently the state of their relationship, clearly wanting more, as does Peter, but it's complicated. This scene is what for me closes the first chapter of this game. 
the pieces are set, the story is teed up, and everything is going to get a whole lot more personal. And what better way to end the first chapter of this game than with this moment? Love seeing you two together again. You always were my favorites. Leaving MJ, we get into a minor tussle with Shocker, which, whilst a fun sequence, isn't greatly important to talk about. It just really works to establish the character as a more minor villain, so that later, when we find out he's been released and is working for someone, it doesn't completely come out of thin air. But there are some nice little quips in this bit, which get a smile out of me. Give it up! You're never gonna catch me! That's what you said last time! I'm just talking! But this could be so much more rewarding if we connected on an emotional level! I, I don't know why that audio sounded so fucked there. I am pretty sure that is not what it sounded like when I actually played the game. Yeah, that's not that's not what it's what if we just what if we just do this? Would this fix it? Right. I mean, I mean that sounds a lot better. A bit weird still, but a lot better. Anyway, after a call from MJ where she talks with Peter about the mask she took from one of the thugs at the auction house, Peter decides to head to Feast to ask Martin Lee about it given his degree in art history. But what this opens up is a whole other can of worms, and this mystery is about to get a whole lot more personal. Lee seems apprehensive, he hides his true intent well, but it's clear, at least to MJ, that there is a lot more beneath the surface. I think this works as an early look into how Peter is willing to always see the best in people, and only under extreme circumstances is he able to do what he has to do and turn his back on someone he's close to. He's willing to continuously give the benefit of the doubt. This is clear by his relationship with Otto, he shows signs again and again of being obsessive with his project, of working himself too hard, of taking things too far, but Peter shrugs it off as passion, as intellect, as misunderstood brilliance, as Otto trying so hard to do the right thing. He only realises he's wrong when it's too late, but we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Continuing to raise the stakes from this moment is when we head back to the lab. Otto is carrying out a road test on his new bionic limb with someone who really needs it. The project seems to be a success, however before they can celebrate, the site has been declared a safety hazard by none other than Mayor Osborne himself. This scene works well to establish the feud between the both of them, Otto and Norman. We don't know the extent of it just yet, but we can see what remains of any relationship they once had. These folks will escort you to Oscorp Robotics, where you'll receive the latest in prosthetics. No charge. This isn't about safety infractions, is it? I'm trying to help you, Otto. You're free to continue your work in a secure environment. At Oscorp. You always were the smartest guy in the room. You haven't changed a bit. Neither of you. Hey, Peter. Harry will be coming back from Europe early next year. Maybe the two of you can start that business you always talked about. This is opportunity knocking. Norman also, very slyly, tries to take Peter away from Otto too, while also mentioning for the first time Chekhov's Harry's Europe trip. Peter tries to console Otto. Clearly he's hit his lowest low at this point, with some time needed to think and Peter seemingly out of a job, we head back out into the city. This is a turning point for Otto. With his project taking too long and the grant gone, he begins to get desperate, and that comes to a head as we explore his arc later down the line. For now though, it's time to touch upon the shiny hilt of Chekhov's Harry's Europe trip gun with his research stations. I will say, I, I do wonder if Pete and MJ like never contacted Harry like at all. Maybe there was an unspoken rule that he was out there to disconnect or something, but Peter does consider calling Harry after leaving Otto's lab. I wish I could do something to help Doc. Maybe call Harry. Ask him to talk to his dad. No. Norman never listens to Harry even tried to kill funding for his research stations. Which is interesting, implying like he thinks he could call Harry, so 
Has he just not ever called him since he's been in Europe? I, I don't know. Harry's research stations are another opportunity for activities in the city. By heading to each, you can activate a task. They each specialize in different projects Harry was working on to monitor the environment around New York City. The first is monitoring toxicity in the air, pollution from cars, and then with that data, the research station will be able to combat it. These are quite nice. I like that the game uses the disparity between Harry and his father as a narrative tool to contextualize environmental concerns within New York City. It does like three things all at once without having to work too hard to get it across. We learn more about Harry, we learn about his relationship with Norman, we learn about how Oscorp doesn't value people or the planet, and we get to find out what each research station does, all while also being educated on pollution and environmental protection. According to a study in 2019 by the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, Annually, ozone pollution in New York City causes around 400 premature deaths, 850 hospitalizations, and around 4,500 emergency visits for health issues such as asthma. There is work being done to help New York in recovering and being better in this regard, but there is a long way to go, so it's nice that Spider-Man briefly touches on this. It's by no means deep or a crazy hard stance on it, but it has something to say nonetheless for people who may not be aware and I appreciate that. I guess since we're back out in the city, it's also worth talking a bit about Fisk construction sites. It's one of the main gang hideouts across the city. These essentially act as a way to test your metal. Usually, the approach is as follows. Head to a site, call up Yuri, have a conversation about how there are illegal activities, and then you stealth the first load of guys, get forced into combat with the rest of the waves of enemies. Usually like six, I think, and Bob's your uncle. I guess this works as a segue into a discussion about combat itself. We'll do stealth later. I just keep putting it off because I don't even know what else there is to say, but I don't know, we'll get, we'll get there. Combat in Spider-Man works similarly to the free flow system in the Arkham series, but obviously fine-tuned for Spider-Man, with a bit of a heavier emphasis on gadgets rather than combos. You hit enemies, and if they're going to hit you, you dodge at the right time, as indicated by the spider sense above your head. If you do a perfect dodge, Spider-Man will blind the enemy with a web temporarily, taking them out of combat, which becomes useful later in the game that you get. The basics never truly change, but the thing that makes this system so fun is how agile you feel, how stringing different moves together just makes you... Sorry about this. It makes you feel like Spider-Man. You can dodge away from an attack into a wall, which will have you briefly stick to the wall from which you can attack and pounce at an enemy, knocking them down. You can use your webs to pull yourself towards an enemy for a strike. If timed after a shot, once you have the ability, you can knock them out instantly. Your webs also work for pulling enemies to you, throwing them around once stunned by a web shot and stringing them up on the walls. Your gadgets act as a way to crowd control or quickly deal with foes. Impact webs instantly stick an enemy to the wall, taking them out. Your little drone things will shoot enemies and be incredibly overpowered. You later on have an air blast that can send guys simply flying from rooftops. It's utterly ridiculous, but I still love doing it, despite how much of an obvious cheese it is. The combat system is probably the best system in the game because it's so deeply thoughtful. If you aren't trying and you're just half paying attention and you're being ganged up on, you will die. It is genuinely challenging at times, especially in the late game, but that's what makes it so satisfying when you enter that flow state, when you dodge every incoming move, when you feel like you have reflexes the speed of a spider, when you build up focus just to release a finishing move on a tough enemy, as you adapt on the fly to different archetypes, whether the shield enemies that you have to dodge under to tackle or rip the shield from with your webs, or larger foes that require a bit more strategy with environmental objects or gadget utilization. There are so many options and they all connect and weave together in a way that makes experimenting feel fulfilling and gratifying in equal measure. I think the biggest issue is that a lot of the combat can be bypassed with some of the insanely overpowered gadgets, like I mentioned before, which is something that Miles Morales actually worked to address by balancing things a lot better, which is why I don't really want to go so hard on it here. They've already addressed it, but that's a whole other video. I mean, Look at this, for example. I can throw a grav thing down on the ground, have the enemies float, and then once they land, hit them with a web bomb, and they're all taken out. This trivializes the whole combat system, because why would I engage in a five-minute fight if I could dispatch them all with minimal effort in ten seconds? Well, the answer is because it's way more fun, and sometimes having style and substance means that even a lack of balancing doesn't greatly affect the experience, because this game is as much about what happens after the fight as what happens during the fight. 
This isn't Assassin's Creed, where you're looking for the fastest way to end a fight to move on. This is a game where combat is a central pillar of fun. The style you command and the efficiency you can reach is fantastic, and that is the fun. It's the same way it's fast to swing like this, but that's really boring, so you end up swinging like this. What I think works so well about the combat in Spider-Man is that it's all about avoiding the onslaught of attacks and looking for windows of opportunity, whether to web up your opponent to a wall, use a swing kick to knock them from a ledge, or to build up your focus meter to use a takedown move. You're always searching for those little openings to dispatch an enemy quickly. It's less about pressing the punch button like an Arkham. You can't enter a literal flow state where you one-punch enemies to the ground one after another, ready for a ground finisher. Instead, you try to get behind enemies. You use your webs, crowd control and deal with them that way. Although Spider-Man has super strength, he's not about beating thugs within an inch of their life. Although, he's not impartial to whipping out the Spider-Bro and gunning everyone down, with what I assume must be a taser. I hope. And look, I, I could sit here and talk about each individual move, each gadget in depth, but this video isn't a critique of Spider-Man, it's a retrospective. And for me, these videos are more to talk about the feeling a game conveys than to be a deep, critical analysis of every single mechanic of a five-year-old game. I don't know, I guess I just find it a little bit redundant and futile, given there isn't really a point to any of these critiques. They've already released a sequel and another right around the corner, both that address a lot of the issues that I do have with the original game. So what's the point in me sitting here analysing it all over again? It doesn't help anybody, and I think what I've said pretty much covers all of it. But the combat has so much depth that I could sit here talking about it all day. Feel free to add your own criticisms or notes in the comments, it's always welcome. We end up pretty quickly in another tangle with Shaka, which is actually a really fun little boss fight. Most of the bosses in this game are genuinely really interesting mechanically. They aren't hard necessarily, but they do require you to remain on your toes and react appropriately. I think Spider-Man really manages to balance a line between being challenging and being accessible in a lot of ways that games of this nature can't manage. You'd expect a Spider-Man game to try and appeal to as many people as possible, and it does do that, but you'd expect them to do that by making the game easier and all about feeling really cool, but the game actually allows itself to be hard, especially on harder difficulties. It's a really well-balanced game, and I think this fight showcases that somewhat, because I was really scuffing my timings. I kept missing the window for throwing objects, not avoiding incoming attacks. I'm really not sure what was going on in my head when I was playing this boss, but I was struggling. But that does allow us to see how Spider-Man, while not being a pillar of difficulty like a Dark Souls, does take skill and attention to play well, which is good. I just wasn't paying any attention to it, obviously. This encounter with Shocker, though, like I said before, establishes that our main man is working with whatever secret shadowy gamer is lurking in the shadows doing bad things. This then works as a segue into tracking down this interesting demon gang. There's been activity at an old Fisk shipyard in Portside, and so we head over there to see what's up, teaming up with a particular police officer. Once arriving, there are guards all over, which means it's up to us to take them all out. This was the fun I talked about earlier in regards to stealth. I really like this particular segment, which to me speaks to how the stealth can be used in challenging ways, it's just that it usually isn't. It still falls into the same trap of literally telling you when enemies can be taken out safely, which does eliminate a whole element of tension that is usually crucial to any stealth games when you commit to that takedown and have no idea if it'll finish in time, if anyone will hear or see you, and the rush when you pull it off and skulk back into the shadows is meaningful. Spider-Man doesn't have that because if a takedown is safe and you press the button, even whilst you're locked into the animation, you become invisible because you were out of sight when you started the animation, which means timing sort of becomes irrelevant. The fun though comes from seeing how efficiently you can take everyone out. There's little challenge in the way of being caught, but using your gadgets, acting fast, taking everyone out in the shortest time possible, that's where the fun is. I would love there to be a balance of both, maybe if you found a more subtle way to indicate whether a stealth takedown was safe, or if once you commit to a takedown enemies can still spot you to add an element of tension but it can still be fun. I think that's really all I have to say in the way of stealth, it's incredibly shallow, incredibly easy, but also can be really fun all the same. But mainly only when you're challenging yourself to do really random shit like this. I mean, it was cool, right? I, I was really proud of it, I hope you liked it. Once everyone is taken down, we're introduced 
to Jefferson Davis. You know we can't have vigilantes trespassing or doing illegal searches. Yeah, I know. Which is why I brought a warrant. So what do you say we do some perfectly legal searching? I like the sound of that. What's your name? Officer Davis. Call me Jeff. And you are? Uh... uh... <laughs> Just messing with you. My son's a big fan. Introducing Officer Davis here is such a brilliant way to incorporate the origin story of Mars Morales in a way that is unconventional but melds itself into this personal journey for Peter. The game is patient, it doesn't do everything at once, it just sows seeds for payoffs hours down the line, and I love that about this game's storytelling. It's something I didn't notice until this replay. We'll explore it in detail as we go along, but the game is absolutely a Miles Morales origin story, through the perspective and eyes of Peter Parker. We get some elements of Miles' POV, and of course that's important for the player, but it never stops being a Peter Parker game. But what it does is constantly weave Miles' story beats into the narrative. It allows time to establish a connection, and a growth, and an understanding of this character. It's a similar thing they do for MJ, of course, too, but with Miles it's done to a greater extent. I don't want to talk about all of it here up front because I find it far more interesting to tackle as it becomes relevant, but god I, I love how they do it. This sequence with Jeff is honestly incredibly wholesome. He talks about his son, he draws parallels to Spider-Man which is cute and sweet and also foreshadowing. But also, we get to see the moral compass of this man in action, under pressure. He does the right thing, he plays by the rules, he genuinely wants to save people, and Spider-Man in the end owes him his life. I also really like the environmental puzzle solving in the warehouse, something about this scratches an itch for me, that's really cool. Once Jeff has been congratulated and is off the scene, that's when MJ shows up, looking for more clues, which adds to some of the clear tension that has been brewing between her and Peter. The bugle put me on the city beat, which means I get to focus full time on real stories like this, and the demons. You know the closer you get to them, the more you become a target, right? The closer I get, the better chance we have to stop them. We? Oui. MJ is passionate, she cares for people and about telling real stories. She wants to get to the bottom of this for all the right reasons, and that's what makes her the perfect ally to Peter, even if currently he can't see past his fear of getting her hurt. I also really like her exchange with Davis. It speaks to the manipulation of the media and the moral stance from which MJ conducts herself in her position. Similar to how Jeff wants to do the right thing in a system that can and often is corrupt, so does MJ. It connects them, and that's how she's able to get her story. Officer Davis, Mary Jane Watson, Daily Bugle. No comment. I don't blame you. But these guys are gonna tell their story with or without you, and they thrive on controversy. So what's your angle? I don't have one. I just listen. Okay. Hop in. He's good. The following sequence plays into consequences following Peter being behind on his rent, a classic Peter Parker story beat. I'm sure I'll put in a joke here about the the rent the guy wants rent from Spider-Man 2. That that's not overplayed. That'll, that'll get a laugh at you, won't it? Alright, fine. Give me rent. If you don't stop asking for rent, I'll shoot your daughter in the skull. He's been evicted from his apartment and has nowhere to stay. Direct consequences from that choice at the very start of the game. The bigger issue for him though is that his stuff has been dumped. This obviously speaks to the common heartlessness of landlords, but also just the general poor treatment and quality of life afforded to those who are struggling financially, despite at their core being good people. We know, as an audience, Peter doesn't deserve this, but this is how the world is. It happens to tons of people, and it's rough. The game doesn't say much more than that, but it's still there as an undertone, and it's in every Spider-Man story. He's the working class hero. After going on a wild goose chase, which is really funny and fun, with some nice little jokes here and there, Peter has to figure out where he's going to stay. He considers MJ's place, but he doesn't want to be a burden, and so he just heads out on patrol, which is where we're introduced to Felicia Hardy my wife. She's trying to attract Spider-Man's attention, which isn't hard. Well, I am. And she's placed these cameras around with little dolls in areas she's robbed to 
I don't know, taunt Spider-Man, I guess. By locating them, you get basic rewards, but also collecting all of them finds her hideout, as well as granting you the dark suit, which isn't at all worth it, which is why I didn't do it. I already platinumed this game, like, twice. I, I wasn't planning to do it again. I have a greater critique of the side content, but that's coming up. Let's just move on for now. Aunt May offers Peter the couch in her office at feast for him to stay the night, and so that's where we're headed. In May's office, we can interact with a few little pieces of memorabilia, and I won't lie, this did choke me up. Miss you. It's so damn simple, but... It just got me, man. Falling asleep on the couch, we wake up to May at work and an envelope with some money in it, with a lovely heartwarming scene that follows. I, I can't take this. You can and you will. I'll pay you back soon. Just ask for help next time. Oh, you are so much like Ben. You have to learn to swallow that Parker pride and accept that you're human like the rest of us. That line, you're so much like Ben, and the way that Peter very subtly reacts with what I assume is pride that he could be anything close to his Uncle Ben just gets me, man. Some of the best scenes in this game are between Peter and May, especially on a replay, knowing what's to come. They're interrupted, though, by Lee, going out of town for some business. It's clear from this scene that Martin means well. He's a good man, but he's been twisted by trauma. Feast was his attempt to do the right thing, but that lingering desire to get revenge is what is his downfall. It's core cool to a lot of Spider-Man villains that Peter could have been these men. He could have fallen down a similar path. He sort of did the night that Uncle Ben died, tracking down his killer, but because of Ben and because of May, Peter becomes a hero. Martin, though, becomes a villain with nobody to guide him. Yet, at the same time, they aren't that different from one another. Back into the city, by this point, we've unlocked the Pigeons. Speaking to Howard, we unlock little mini-events all over the city in which we can find and grab Pigeons. And I guess, stuff them into our suit so that we can return them to Howard. So much of the side content in this game is so incidental and kind of a little bit pointless and random. But also, I, I do love getting the pigeons. Although, pigeon bias aside, the, the side content in this game can feel deeply lacking. I did a few of the side quests, which are separate from the city events, and... Dude, they just didn't do anything for me. I, I don't care about some woman's husband who's likely got involved with a bank heist, or some guy pretending to be Spider-Man. They don't feel constructive to the game, they feel like this entirely separate random thing. The thing about this, though, is that Miles Morales remedied this. All of the side content in that game feels so constructive to an overall point, and I love that improvement. But again, that's a that's a whole other video. Jeff is preparing to receive an award at the Osborne Rally, happening later in the day, but before that, he calls you up to give you a tip about the demons hitting a Fisk construction site in the city, which is the classic E3 demo mission. This sequence is one of the most well-known in Spider-Man 2018, because it was the first ounce of gameplay we ever saw, and the site of the infamous Puddlegate scandal. Plus, it is one of the most spectacular sequences in the game, from the navigation and stealthing of the construction site itself, using this pipe to knock down a bunch of guys at once, I love this, to the mad scramble to pull down the helicopter and the intense rush to stop the giant crane falling, Swinging through Midtown, chasing a helicopter that's smashing through the world with the, I don't know, I don't know what this is, like an electricity thing, box thing, a generator, I don't know. When the generator slams through an office building and leaves Spider-Man running from it, only to duck beneath as it flies ahead, causing him to slam it through the floor of another building and continue forward, parkouring over debris and swinging right through the helicopter. It's such a beautiful set piece that I don't think will ever get old. Finally, taking the helicopter down, Peter is able to avoid any further casualties, webbing it up between two buildings saving the day again for everybody to see. But only one onlooker is truly important. One kid filming the event. Miles Morales. Hey, fanboy. Introducing Miles here works so well given the following mission. To have Miles be witness to what we just experienced and then switch perspective to him speaking with... Actually, who the fuck is this guy? Because that's not Ganky, is it? Uh, never mind. We get to see Miles look up to Spider-Man in a similar way to how he looks up to his dad as a beacon of morality, and it tees up, as it should, the following mission. The Osborne Rally. There's the stage entrance. And we'll be right out front. 
Sounds like a lot of people out there. You'll be fine, honey. The last time I gave a speech, I was in high school. Miss Steinberg gave me a C minus. Well, if only Miss Steinberg could see you now. Hey, you got this, Dad. I mean, come on, you saved Spider Man. I'm pretty sure that makes you an official superhero. <laughs> a superhero? <laughs> or maybe I'm just a guy who doesn't give up. Just a guy who doesn't give up. This is Miles's with great power comes great responsibility. I talked about this in my original Miles Morales video way back when, but Miles is already a hero. He doesn't have to learn it. Peter got his powers and then over time had to learn how to be a hero, to use that power for a greater good, to understand that he had a responsibility. Miles already knows this, even without powers, He's a hero. He has his father. He has Spider-Man, which is what makes Miles so interesting. People often say it's unfair Miles always has to be tagged on to another Peter story in some way, but that's what I find the most compelling. Miles Morales stories, whether in PS4 or Spider-Verse or the Ultimate Comics, act as a deconstruction of Spider-Man as a concept. Because Miles knows who Spider-Man is, you're able to have a meta-commentary on the hero but without becoming meta. You can remain an earnest exploration of the hero through the medium without breaking the fourth wall. Miles allows Spider-Man stories to tackle what it means to be Spider-Man in a world where Spider-Man already exists. But I've gone into that part in detail in my Miles Morales video from 2021. The rally sequence moves so fast but says so much. We watch from the perspective of Peter and MJ who are chatting to each other in the crowd as Jeff accepts his award. Everything slowly begins to become more tense as Norman gets a phone call from an unknown caller threatening him and Peter's spider senses go off. It becomes apparent very fast that things are going south. On the stage, one of the demon's men reveals bombs strapped to his person and in an instant Jeff pushes the man back and goes to dive on the people nearby to protect them from the blast. Immediately we cut away to Peter doing the exact same to MJ. A direct mirroring is drawn between these two in this moment of selflessness of a hero. Those are Jefferson Davis's last moments. As the bombs go off and as people die, we cut to black. The music cuts and the camera comes back into focus as Miles is being dragged away by guards. His mother, inconsolable, unsure if her son and husband have both been taken from her in an instant. As Miles glances over, Peter Parker lays motionless on the ground as Mary Jane panics as well. The framing of this moment when we take control of Miles for the first time is powerful in every way it needs to be. As the player, we are aware that Spider-Man isn't coming. We don't even know if he's still alive. Rio heads off to try and look for Jeff, and as Miles comes to, we head into the fray ourselves. There's something so spine-chilling about picking up as Miles and looking down at Peter on the floor unconscious, and we have to head into danger alone. We have the same drive we've had for the whole game, one of heroism, but we know we are so much weaker than we have been. Miles saves his mother and heads to look for his dad. Miles is a hero before he even gets close to being Spider-Man, and that's what makes his character so significant to me. He's willing to put himself at risk to save his father, someone he sees as the greatest hero there is. It's no coincidence that this Miles' canon event, if you will, happens before he gets bitten by the radioactive spider. Miles finds his father's body in the blast zone and we cut to black. Dad! Dad! Dad, no! Wake up, Dad. Wake up. Wake up. Norman Osborn shakes the hand of Rio and Miles, an empty consolation from the man who was the target of the attack. All that's felt is a sense of emptiness. This funeral acts narratively as a way for us to connect deeper with Miles, as we already connected with Jeff, and for us to relive, in a way, the death of Uncle Ben. Peter knows how this feels. He went through this exact thing, which 
is why he speaks to Miles with genuine care. I'm sorry for your loss. Do I know you? I'm Peter Parker. I was at City Hall when... Look, I know you don't know me, but I just wanted to say... I know what you're going through. Uh, that's what you were going to say, right? Or it all gets easier with time. Or don't worry. It's, it's part of God's plan. I'm sorry. I was just try trying to help. I know. Peter knows that feeling so intensely and wishes he could do more for Miles. The personal angle of having us bond with Jeff first before we ever even see Miles, I feel just enriches the scene. There are so many personal ties here, so much emotional weight and baggage. Peter and Miles are so similar yet in this scene so distant, and by the end, will become close friends. Once we've had some time to dwell on everything that just happened with some atmospheric and tonally appropriate rain, which is a hell of a vibe to swing around in, we're introduced to Silver Sable. Uh, no, that's that's the whole no that's the whole no, that's all I've got. I, I think she's fine. She doesn't get too much to do and works as more of an annoying foil for Spider-Man than anything else. I don't find it satisfying when they team up at the end because there's no real substance to any of their interactions. It's just sort of like, Spider-Man saves the day, Sable gets annoyed and pulls out her epic pistols, and that happens like multiple times and that's it, that's what she does. Thankfully though, they've brought her back in the really good DLC that wasn't terrible to finally give her character something to do. Which by the way, I made a whole video on exclusive to Patreon, link in the description if you want to give it a watch. Off the back of this though, we get a really nice scene with Peter and May at Feast talking about my which I think was just really nice. Peter! So if you're running this place while Mr. Lee's out of town, who's doing your old job? Uh, me. But I could always use more help. You know anyone? Actually, I do. His name is Miles Morales. Why does that sound familiar? His father was being honored at City Hall. Oh. I talked to him at the funeral. He's a smart kid. He's just having a tough time. I knew a boy like that once. I remember it helped to uh, stay busy. It might help him too. Here's his mom's number. Thanks. I'll give her a call. Peter understands Miles, and bringing him in and giving him something to care about and be a part of with Feast is just what Miles needs, and uh, Peter's there for him. I also really love this final part of the scene too. I've got a few minutes before work. I'm gonna look around, see if there's anything else I can do to help you out. Oh, you, you don't have to. I know. I want to. Although, however, Peter is a lying sack of shit because he actually uses this opportunity to break into Martin Lee's office, knowing at this point that he's the leader of the demons. Which I neglected to mention earlier, that that's a, that's a major plot point, although it's not really treated as such. It's, it's weird, it's just sort of like a thing that we know now, but... Also, obviously, we already knew it. I suppose because the true reveal is not Martin Lee, but Otto. I still, I guess it's a bit weird how the reveal in context has no real fanfare at all when Peter figures it out. I, I don't know. This bit is really great, though. For a start, I love seeing Peter do Spider-Man shit out of the suit when he zips up to this vent in, in the, on the ceiling. Something about it just satisfies my brain, but as well as the puzzle solving being nifty, or the little trap room being all wired up, or the letter Lee left for May showing his true duality, again mirroring Peter in a lot of ways, the bit that I love, the bit that is so Spider-Man, is when we leave the office and- Hello, Peter. Mr. Lee, I thought you were out of town. Did you find what you were looking for? Martin, you're back. Let me get that. Thank you. And heading off again shortly, I'm afraid. Just needed a few things from my office. You must have heard about City Hall. Yes. Tragic. Peter was there. He was very lucky. And an Osborne rally. I didn't know you were a fan. Well, what matters is, you are both safe. Amen. But the bombers are still out there. 
Who knows what they've planned next? Oh, I don't think you or May have anything to worry about. As long as you stay away from places you're not supposed to be. Well, I should go. When will you be back? When my work is done. Peter bumps right into Martin Lee. When the lives of both Peter and Spider-Man intersect and cross over, that's when Spider-Man stories shine, and this is no exception. This moment of brief tension as you realise Martin has probably figured out who Peter is, just as Peter has figured out who Martin is, but it's unspoken, it's so Spider-Man. Reminiscent of the Thanksgiving scene in Spider-Man 1, or the car scene in Spider-Man Homecoming. It's those moments that give me goosebumps, I'm such a slut for that shit. And talking of moments where Peter and Spider-Man's lives intersect, we have another lab session with Otto, who's getting closer to realising his goals. However, this particular session goes a tad awry. Damn it! This is all your fault, Norman, you son of a- Well, I know who you're not voting for in the next election. <laughs> that gets me every time. I, I don't know what it is, but it, it fucking cracks me up. The thing is, though, you can see Otto cares. He regrets losing it, and he values Peter, but his health is getting to him. Although, we'll talk about that later since it doesn't actually come up yet in the story. What does come up, however, is the relationship, or lack thereof, between Otto and Norman, which adds more layers to this story. We were lab partners in college. Became friends. Decide to start a business. We both had visions of changing the world just in different ways. Wait, you were at Oscorp when it started? I'm half the reason it's called Oscorp. In grad school, everyone called us the O's. <sighs> Add Corp to that and, well, it is a catchy name. Well, why'd you leave? Norman became more and more obsessed with genetics. He started a project I considered unethical. And there was this... Anyway, lawyers got involved. I chose to leave in exchange for a settlement. But that money didn't last very long. I've relied on grants ever since. If this project doesn't work... Don't worry. It'll work. Uh, let, me, let me just fix this up. I'll brew some fresh coffee. I really like this dialogue from Otto because not only does it give us a window into his morality and humanity despite what becomes of him, it also talks to his knowledge of what Norman was working on, what led to Mr. Negative and also Devil's Breath, which all comes together by the end. There's just these little seeds of knowledge or motivation from Otto within dialogue that informs his character that I think is utterly superbly executed. I really love this. With the arm control fixed, Peter and Otto toast to a companionship reforged. I also love that Peter genuinely believes in Otto here. He wants to continue working with him despite not being able to get paid. He believes in Otto so deeply, and doing the legwork for that now and across the game is what makes the end so much more heartbreaking. But sadly, the game can't actually stay good for long as we're forced once again into the shoes of Mary Jane Watson. I will say, on the sliding scale of MJ missions that range from awful to inoffensively boring, this is one of the better ones? I think? You've got these boxes you can push on the ground to make noise and distract enemies, you've got the epic tombstone cameo that made me soy jack back in 2018, but the great part of every MJ mission is usually the interaction we get from Pete and MJ after or prior to the mission taking place. The scene in MJ's apartment with Peter making a chicken curry, MJ researching their next move, is just really cosy, it's wholesome, and I like it a lot. You know tombstone is crazy and pretty much invincible, right? Everybody has their weakness. Mine is whatever you're cooking right now. <laughs> it smells amazing. The chicken curry. Uh, just needs some time to simmer. No dumplings, I hope. You're never going to let me live that one down, are you? Nope. <laughs> the great dumpling catastrophe. I still can't believe they evacuated the entire building. I know, and in January, too. <laughs> Your neighbors hated me. Yeah, they were pretty happy when we broke up. <laughs> yeah. So... 
It's a little cringe, but I think that's what makes it feel so genuine. I also do love how this scene works to push forward MJ's arc of truly becoming Peter's partner in more than just a romantic relationship sort of way. She's becoming the partner to Spider-Man 2, which is what would always have to happen if Peter wanted a true long-term relationship with somebody. He gives her the special lore devices, which do make her missions a tad bit better, and they discuss next steps. MJ wants to be his partner. Peter, though, uses the word sidekick. MJ is trying at every turn to gain his approval, for him to see her as an equal and their arc together across the game honestly plays into Peter's lack of reluctance to train and work miles by the end. He learns to open up. This scene ends with also a great scene too that I can't not mention. It just gets a laugh out of me every single time. Charles Standish. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Oh, Oscorp CFO. Wait. You don't think this has anything to do with Lee, do you? Sorry to cook and run. Did... Did you just leave your clothes on the kitchen floor? Uh... Where, where do you want me to, uh... Just a couch is fine. <laughs> yeah. See you later? Yeah. I think it's the eyes that get me, they just widen in such a comical way. I also want to point out before we move on that it's interesting MJ has a little plushie of the advanced suit, which Peter only recently made like a few weeks ago, so they started production on Spider-Man merch incredibly fast. Merch that I guess MJ buys? Is that, is that a bit weird? I don't know. Peter has to run though, because Oscorp CFO John Standish has been broken into. Now I'll be honest with you, this part of the game loses me a little bit. Not because it's particularly bad, but because it's a lot of setup and exposition to make latter points make more sense. It's doing the legwork that it's forced to do in order to get us to the core reveal of GR27. However, it does feel like a little bit of a wild goose chase, going from place to place, chasing scientists. I enjoy the elevator shaft set piece, that's fun. You know, as elevator shafts go, this is pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> From our boy Standish, who looks like a Ubisoft antagonist, we then move on to Isaac Delaney, the head of the genetics, biotechnology, and analytical chemistry departments at Empire State University, who was hired by Oscorp to peer review GR27. Tracking him down takes us to a Halloween party, reminding us all on vaguely what time of year the game takes place, and has us do funny little memes for a bit. Hey, what's wrong with you? There he is. The lizard in the lab coat. Spider-Man! On a first go of the game, this bit was probably cute and fun, but on replays, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm being a boring little cynical bitch, but I just find it to be filler and bloat. I also think it's really, really funny how Peter wails on the students who've been taken over by Miss Negative. It's really funny. It's so over the top, dude. Dude, they're just peep. Leave them alone. A great scene here, though, and one of the standouts is building on the hate Martin has for Osborne to learn the connection between them. We see Lee threaten and use his powers on Delaney, killing his own men to absorb their power too. Lee wants what he wants, and he wants it badly enough that he's willing to sacrifice a lot to get it, which builds the emotional investment for us in Lee's goal. Why does he care this much? Under the effects of Mr. Negative's corruption, Delaney reveals that the man he was working with on GR27 is Dr. Morgan Michaels. Upon learning this, instead of letting him go free, Lee uses his corruption power to have the man shoot himself in the head. This is such a dark moment in what has mainly been a pretty light-hearted game. Sure, it has its moments, but showing a forced suicide? It adds a dimension to Martin's character that completely alters how we view him. So far, he's been a man doing what he believes is right, slightly twisted in his means and his actions have cost us, but this feels personal and evil. Peter surmises it's time to pay a visit to Norman's office in Oscorp Tower to see what he can learn about GR27. Before that though, with some time in the city, I thought it was worth touching on one of the final unlocks we get for side content, Taskmaster. Around the city, he places these little computer terminal box things, and by accessing them, we're able to do challenges, bomb, stealth, combat, and drone challenges. Taskmaster's whole MO is learning about these heroes through data collecting and assimilating their skills to be able to be unbeatable by the best of the best. After completing a few challenges, you have to fight him, and ultimately, you lose. After beating all of the challenges, you have another fight which you are able to win. I'm sure they'll maybe do something with this bitch in Spider-Man 2, I I'm not 
here to speculate though because it'll date this video too much for anyone watching after Spider-Man 2 is out. The challenges themselves are actually really fun though and they act as ways to test your ability to pull off the mechanics of the game as fast as possible. My favourites are probably the drone and bomb challenges mainly because combat and stealth are tested in literally every other part of the game and while they're harder here because it's about your points and time, something about the bomb runs and the drone chases I find more engaging. They aren't deep but they are fun and I enjoy them. Having to adapt on the fly and find the fastest route to each bomb or make sure to maneuver in a way to hit all of the gates in a drone chase just feels good man, these slap. Onto Oscorp Tower though, we have to break into the top floor. This sequence is a fun little mini game of avoiding searchlights and drones as you follow the wires from each circuit box and hack them to eventually open Norman's office door. There's something about when the game has you forced to like crawl along a wall or the ceiling like an actual spider that I really love. Just like crawling slyly around light sources and weaving through gaps or something. When Spider-Man does things that allow for little moments where Peter is acting like a real spider, there's something that just does something for me there in my brain. He's not just a man that can swing from ropes and stick to walls, he actually moves like a spider sometimes and I just think those details are really cool. Peter overhears Norman on the phone with Fisk referencing the statue where MJ found the files the plot thickens. Getting inside of Norman's office, we access his personal computer. Lucky for us, there's a PowerPoint presentation all about the origins and the state of GR27, nicknamed Devil's Breath by the scientists. Honestly, the fact that the big reveal about what all of this is, is done through a slideshow presentation with corporate designs and nice images like stockman holding briefcase is really funny. The presentation has all the information we need, why GR27 was created, as a cure for genetic diseases, and what it is in its current state, a bioweapon, capable of killing everyone in the city if stolen by Lee, which seems to be his goal. I do like also how this plays into things Otto mentioned about Norman, and obviously is all about the underlying mystery of Harry Osborn. I think on a replay, a lot of these elements gel together more, knowing where it all goes by the end. Understanding that all of the different narrative components all just weave in and out of each other elegantly is really satisfying to watch unfold. Knowing Otto, Norman, and Lee's motives and history, knowing what's really going on, seeing how Peter's relationship with MJ plays into the relationship with Miles, there's so much going on at once, and it does it almost effortlessly. With Michaels always carrying around the sample of what is currently a bioweapon, Peter and MJ are in a race against time to figure out where he is and stop Lee from getting- Oh, for God's sake! Okay, so we have another MJ mission. I, I was actually just having too much fun, so I'm glad they put this in here. MJ now has the special Spider-Man lore things that we, we never see Peter use. However, they are really cool. It allows for a bit of actual player agency when moving around, although don't get me wrong, it's still very much scripted stealth. It's not real. You don't have to figure anything out. You just throw the lore in the obvious spot the game wants you to and Bob's your uncle. I think maybe that's what's so boring about these, the lack of autonomy me, it's completely on rails, and so there is no tension, no sense of you overcoming a situation, it's just walking in a straight line and sometimes pressing a button. And I think in their quest for ultimate accessibility, this may have been a major oversight. While MJ is questioning Standish, Peter jumps in to save her. It was well intended, but it was the wrong move and stopped MJ from truly learning about a plan that was set to take place at Grand Central Station regarding the demons. He fucked up here, and like MJ points out, all he could say was, Sorry, Charlie, which honestly is really funny, but she has every right to be frustrated with him for that. I, I also just realised in this moment that I've been calling him John Standish instead of Charles Standish, which is really embarrassing because John Standish is from... Uh, he's from another game. I really enjoy their phone call after this moment, though. MJ voicing her frustrations. You know, this is exactly why we broke up. I thought we broke up so you could focus on your career. We broke up because you wouldn't stop treating me like a baby. Don't do this, MJ. Don't do that, MJ. Oh, that's too dangerous, MJ. I may not have super spider powers, but I'm not made out of glass. And Peter's struggling to understand her and feeling his own frustrations with her recklessness. You snuck into the middle of an armed military... You know what? Can we not do this right now? Please? The disconnect between them at this point severs a connection that has been their strength for the entirety of the game. Their teamwork has led them to solve huge mysteries and deal with great odds, even if they weren't totally seeing eye to eye. After this moment, it'll take what happens at Grand Central to open Peter's eyes, but we'll, we'll get to that. We learn Michaels is being kept at the Bowery by Sable, and he's being moved tomorrow at noon, which is something to get on. But first, 
another stop at Otto's lab. Otto is close to perfecting the neural interface and just needs a few more tweaks. Once done, he begins the demonstration using a bucket full of tennis balls. Slowly but surely, he picks them up, throwing them into the air, juggling more and more of them as the camera pans back with a gorgeous shot of his silhouette and the additional arms extended higher. This is his peak before he falls so far. And that shot is obvious foreshadowing of what's to come. One thing I really like about Otto's project, and I'm not sure it's entirely intentional, although I'd elect to suggest that it is, is that every time we see his cybernetic arms, they're less and less human. From a metal arm that is made to replicate a normal one, to an extension of one's capabilities, to these two arms that can stretch and bend and do incredible things, to claws, tentacles, something alien. With every new development, as his ability to move his body slowly dwindles, his creation gets less and less human, in line with how he becomes, by the end, less human. This is the scene, of course, where Peter learns of Otto's degenerative neurological disorder, probably caused by exposure to toxic chemicals during his youth, although I have speculated that perhaps it was caused by exposure to the research he did with Norman relating to Devil's Breath. Who knows? Peter sticks by him, keeps his secret as Otto did for him. They embrace. It's moving. Otto wants to take things further using a neural interface directly implanted into the base of the skull that interfaces with the basal ganglia. Peter, exploring the lab, mentions that doing so with his neurological issues could affect him badly, causing it to completely alter his personality, as is always the way with Doc Ark. Otto's fall and motivations and personality shift isn't so simple though. There's a deeper nuance that we'll explore with his character by the time we reach the ending, I assure you. The next sequence I adore. I'm always a sucker for anything regarding Miles. Peter is heading to feast. It's Miles' first day. On the way, he comes across Miles being attacked by a couple of basic muggers. Easy work for Spider-Man. But what follows is one of the more wholesome moments in the game. Miles adores Spider-Man. Other than his dad, it's the hero he looks up to the most, as I'm sure most kids in the city do. Miles wants to help. He wants to do the right thing. It's what motivated him to join Feast in the first place. It's the legacy his father left him with. And so he asks Spider-Man for advice. Peter tells him if they're bigger, you have to be quicker, a classic Spider-Man trait, but what Miles responds with will always get me. Okay, but that's it's easy for you to say. I, sorry, I just can't do what you do. It's a moment that hits knowing what Miles can become and will become in his own game, a kid that just wants to do the right thing, that becomes Spider-Man. Peter turns back and gives him a quick lesson to avoid a punch and throw one right back. Now use your feet, and when they go off balance, look for an opening. Boom. Like that? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Not only this time, just let me have it. Right on the jaw. Okay? okay? I can. Take it. Oh, sh. S sorry. No, no. No. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> you keep that up and uh, you'll be fine. This scene just makes me feel good. It's one of those formative moments in Miles' story, and it means so much more coming back years later. The transition then is really clever. Spider-Man swings away, but we are left with Miles on the street level, the camera even angled from below as we look up, as Miles always does, to Spider-Man. Making our way to the feast shelter, we're forced against our will to engage with MJ gameplay with a Miles Morales skin. The gameplay with the hacking tool is kind of cool, but it's still completely trivial and shallow. Just ignore the fact that I failed this like three times though. Although it does work to characterize Miles' intelligence and self-sufficiency. One of the biggest parts of this is how great the city looks though. As you're walking through the market and the streets, it reminds me honestly of the opening scene of Miles Morales, having Miles just walk among the people. It's very much who he is, and it's another instance of showcasing the incredible fidelity of the city space in this game. Just before arriving at Feast, we have a phone call from Rio and a little chat between her and Miles. I love their relationship in this game, and it only becomes more meaningful in Miles' own game. And to talk about being among the people of the city, heading into Feast is the perfect follow-up. Miles enters the shelter and meets with Peter, clearly anxious but wanting to help. Peter gets him to go around and bring everyone some coffee. This is the most unrelatable part of the whole game, because if someone asked me at 15-ish years old to go around a homeless shelter that I've never visited and hand out coffee and get to know people, I'd freeze up and shrivel into nothing. I, I guess this is just another way that Miles is a hero. That confidence is remarkable. I love seeing Miles go around and speak to these people. He 
really does just have a way with regular people, making them feel good. You have this guy doing a crossword and Miles solves it for him with some sciency jargon. Not unless you know what the hell a quark is. It's a subatomic particle. You know, the building block of protons, neutrons, hadrons? Subatomic. It fits. Good one, kid. I have no idea in what reality that would ever be the answer to a crossword puzzle, especially when one of the answers is bird. But hey, uh, it works to show us again Miles is a smart ass kid, just like Peter was and remains. You've also got the following encounter with the angry TV guy. Oh, we have a couple of CRTs at school. I know how to fix these CR when they're- CR what? No, no, you just gotta smack it a couple times. Get it. Go! Or, could be a loose coax cable. Alright, alright. Be my guest, huh? Miles is more than happy to help and is already getting on so well at Feast, but upon fixing the TV, he's met with a news report covering a tribute to his father. Immediately, the smile is wiped off of his face and he's yanked back to reality. Anyone who's ever had to deal with any form of emotional trauma or grieving in this way knows how that feels. You distract yourself enough to not remember why you needed to be distracted only to be pulled right back down and have that experience and realization of where you are all over again. It doesn't help that the grumpy old guy makes an awfully snide remark. Man didn't do nothing heroic except get himself blown up. Peter comes out to check on Miles in what seems like a random coincidence, but I think or feel it was intentional. Peter perhaps overheard with his heightened senses and came to the rescue in a way that wasn't a confrontation or aggressive, but solved the situation and made Miles feel better. That's how I want to see it anyway. Listen, kid, I'm, I'm sorry about your dad. Come on, Miles. See if Aunt May needs a hand in the kitchen. This also, though, speaks to the nuance of the people Spider-Man has to fight to protect. Not everyone in the city is going to be nice to everyone all the time, but you have to save them anyway. You have to work to better their lives, despite the fact that they're bound to have off days, be flawed, sometimes outright rude. Nobody gets left behind, despite that. Peter brings Miles into the kitchen with May for him to give her a hand with the food. May is so sweet as ever, and Miles calls out to Peter to thank him. This scene placed right next to the scene in which Miles is saved by and thanks Spider-Man is beautiful synergy of the duality of Spider-Man. Miles has been supported by Spider-Man physically and by Peter emotionally. It strengthens their bond and partnership moving into Miles Morales and Spider-Man 2. I love it so much. The game just keeps on throwing you these parallels and mirrors and it does so much to serve the themes of the game. It's just wonderful. Back to Spidey work, Michaels is being moved today and we have to make sure that Lee doesn't interfere. And so of course, Lee absolutely interferes. This is yet another point in which the game is showing off a set piece that just completely bangs. Even if sometimes the physics on the back of the truck do get a bit weird and wobbly. I'll let it slide because it was really funny actually. The climax of this though is when Lee attempts to use his corruption powers on Peter taking him into a mind world where Peter has to fight back against Lee's will to win and escape. But the interesting part is what Lee talks about in this portion. He speaks to Peter's guilt of not being able to save everyone, a tactic of emotional manipulation that does make Peter waver. He wasn't able to save Jeff even after he saved him. But the most interesting part is that what Martin speaks of with regards to Norman Osborn, we agree with. That officer saved your life, didn't he? He was here because of you, and Norman wanted to use him. A futile gesture in the end. And where was Norman during all this? Slinking away like a rat. He knew what was going to happen, and he fled. Norman is a hidden cancer on this city. He must be excised with no trace of his corruption to return. Norman hides behind his mask of lies. I will break it apart and drag him into the light. Norman is a hidden cancer. The things he does, the people he uses, he's a bad man. But he's not a supervillain, and so Spider-Man can't act. He can't just go attacking Norman Osborn without cause. But then that births these super criminals, doing what they have to do to get their own back at a man who wronged them and continues to wrong people, and is by the merit of who Spider-Man is, protected by a superhero. 
Like we said before, you have to protect everyone in the city, even Osborne. Martin is extreme, he's a terrorist, but what he wants is good, which is what makes this so complex. The same goes for Otto later on. There are personal vendettas and moral stances all tied up in the acts of violence. Peter is framed as morally correct because, of course, you can't go around doing terrorism in order to fight an evil corporate head. It's a flaw in the nuance of the writing, making a villain who would otherwise be sympathetic to be an obviously bad person because they do irredeemable things is something these sorts of games and films often do to avoid having to scrutinise the protagonist too heavily and this is a Spider-Man game at the end of the day. But the point is still there, and it's thought-provoking, especially for the future of this iteration of the character. Peter breaks free of Martin's hold and pulls the truck off of the road, stopping it from killing innocents in the way, ramming it into the side of a building, knocking himself out briefly. This scene works to reinforce the struggle Peter goes through of not being able to save everyone. He does all he can to save the people the truck was going to plow into, but he can only do his best, and sometimes it isn't enough. When he comes to, the serum is gone. Peter helps Michaels up and Sable steps in, and I love how Peter puts his arm in front of Michaels. Spider-Man isn't often intimidating in the traditional sense, but that simple motion really is, and I love it. Sable throws out a line of dialogue that again sort of plays into these core themes we've been talking about of Peter's self-doubt. So-called superhero. You think you save people, but you just make it worse. This is your fault. It's sort of played off and then she kicks him in the face, but like, it's still good. The idea of not being able to save everyone. His self-doubt kicks in after his detachment from MJ. He worries he's unable to save everyone. He shoulders all of the responsibility himself. But when that responsibility is shared, more good can be done. A lesson soon to be learned by both him and MJ too. What follows is a phone call with Michaels in which he talks about the most likely release points of Devil's Breath airports, train stations, bus terminals. He also talks about how this project is personal to Norman. Devil's Breath is personal for Norman. It's been his obsession for decades. The project breaks every state and federal regulation on the books, but he doesn't care. Never mind re-election. He'd be tried in The Hague for war crimes. Decades he's been working on this. Just another little hint to the greater personal weight this plot thread carries for him and for Harry. Of course, Devil's Breath is planned to be released in Grand Central Station so it can spread like wildfire. And who else is at Grand Central other than our favourite reporter, Mary Jane Watson? This section isn't super heinous though. It looks incredible for a start, but more importantly, it has very clear setups and hints to Norman's tech that will be worked into Green Goblin for sure. These special medical drones that look very much like gliders, the optical camouflage, the nanotech, it's obvious where this is going. But the thing that we're here for is this. This Gaia microbe dispersal device releases specially formulated microbes into the atmosphere. Oh no, that can't be good. Martin and his men storm the station and have to be dealt with. Devil's Breath is placed in the dispersal unit and so MJ calls Peter for help. This bit is honestly pretty great. Like I said, we're getting into Stockholm Syndrome territory now because the others were genuinely so boring, anything with a tiny bit of fun is a winner. You get to command Spider-Man to take down guys for you when you've split them up silently and make your way through the station. Honestly, it's, it's, it's worth it just for the animation that Spider-Man does from a distance. It looks, it looks really good. <laughs> good job. Now let's get you out of here. What about the devil's breath? I'll come back for it. No, we're partners, remember? MJ and Peter are still struggling to see eye to eye on the whole partners thing, but they're forced to work together here because MJ is right. They don't have time for Peter to swing her outside, they have to focus on the task at hand, and it pushes them into a scenario where they prove to each other that they are better as a team. Peter takes out the guys and makes way for MJ to reach the central group where the dispersion device is. I really like the little mini game for neutralizing it. It's not deep, and I'd act to be hard pressed to even say this is a mini game, but Man, it's like someone is just massaging my brain when I follow one wire from the right, 
all the way to the left and unhook it correctly. They've really packed some small yet brain-tingling cocaine mechanics into this game. Once that's dealt with, it's time for us to take control of Spider-Man again, stealthing around to clear out most of the thugs. MJ is then able to get the people to safety while we deal with the stragglers. The major moment though comes from when we follow Martin onto the train. The contextual weight of this fight is really what makes it work, because on a mechanical level, it's one of the most shallow things I think ever made in the history of video games, including Pong. You basically punch him unless he does this, then you press circle. If he does this, then you press X. Then you continue punching him. And that's the whole fight. It's shit. I love it. Finally though, reaching the front of the train, we shove him into a control box for the train and... Oh wow, it, re it really was that easy. Someone should have just like tased him sooner or something. But with the train controls broken, the train hurtling towards a dead end, Peter has to act fast and so references the critically acclaimed Spider-Man 2 directed by Sam Raimi, aka the greatest superhero film of, of all time. Please put your incorrect disagreements in the comments. <sighs> that totally worked last time. Is this on the nose? Yes. Do I still love it? Uh, absolutely. With it not working though, Peter has to think of something else. Luckily, we happen to be on the train that passed under a road that isn't in use just as it was about to crash, which is a relief when things work out that well for you, isn't it? Grabbing the front of the train with the webs, he pulls it and crashes through the ceiling onto the road above. Everyone's safe, nobody harmed, Martin Lee in custody, and Devil's Breath taken back to the Oscorp lab. Everything's great. Nothing could possibly go wrong. This is Mary Jane Watson. Please leave a detailed message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, hey, it's me. Let me know when you want to talk. I really love this little text conversation post-defeat of Lee. Not only does it work as a way to convey where Peter and MJ are at now, not being sure of their relationship after working together all this time, they won this fight, but will Peter be down to let her help properly again in the future, long term? There's still some uncertainty, but things are slowly working out. It also works as a really funny gag about how texting someone you're dating can be misleading and get across the wrong message. It's like an age-old gag, but I don't know. In my old age, I had this good cliche. <laughs> after some spidey work in the city after a job well done, it's time to head off to Otto's lab, which I'll preface by mentioning this is the last visit we make to Otto before shit really hits the fan. Wait, where are the arms? Oh, wow. So cool. But how did you... Intracranial neural network. Neurotransmission speeds under one nanosecond. Faster than signals travel inside the brain. Never mind to an external prosthesis. We did it, Peter. No one can take this away from us. Now, I, I do have to ask, just up front, I get that this is an impressive feat and everything, but... In what reality would someone who's lost a limb want four octopus tentacles to replace it? Like, in what world are these a practical tool to be applied to anyone's life? At least in Spider-Man 2, Otto created the arms as a means to interact with the fusion reaction. In this, he just creates them because, I don't know, he genuinely believes they're superior to arms and hands. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I pour myself a drink, I do think this is great, but I would prefer if I had giant tentacles that I couldn't properly fit into a normal sized kitchen. That would be like an ideal situation right now. The neural implant though is, is fucked. Going through all the mini games, things just get worse and worse and worse. There are severe side effects and they need to be fixed. Otto is damaging his brain badly. Peter confronts him on this while he's intimidatingly revealing two more arms that he had tucked away up his ass. But Otto isn't happy. I just think we need some more We've tests. Got enough. I'm sure at this point Peter is having flashbacks to all of the supervillains that he's fought. The following conversation though is the last time Peter speaks with Otto. The true Otto. The man he revered and trusted and wanted the best for the world. And in that context, it's especially touching. We're close. I'll keep at it. I'll work out some bugs. Go. Go. You sure you're okay? Yes. Thank you, Peter. For... For everything. We now take you live to Grand 
Central Terminal, where Mayor Osborne is about to address the media. Martin Lee is now behind bars. When I make a promise to this city, I keep it. The people of New York will soon make a decision that could change the course of this city forever. So when you're casting your vote, remember what I've done. We are all safer now than we have ever been. Liar! Oh no. You have no idea what you're in for. One of the best parts about this scene is actually the one that follows, which doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense, but just give me a second. Peter swings by Feast to talk with May after what happened with Martin, she's now running the place all by herself. A job she loves as she says, these people need help. If I lose a few hours sleep, so be it. This line, of course, directly parallels Peter's work as Spider-Man, reinforcing May once again as a hero. The part I wanted to look at, though, is the next line. But the Martin I know couldn't have done that. Whatever's become of him, that's not the one I want to remember. It's a tiny line, but having it placed directly after the scene with Otto is no coincidence. I said it way earlier, but Otto is to Peter what Lee is to May. Someone they looked up to. Someone who they felt wanted what they wanted, and someone who betrayed them. May wants to remember Martin as the man he was to her, not the man he became. But can Peter do the same with Otto? Can he afford to? May goes on to ask Peter about MJ, and he says how it's complicated. May suggesting honesty is what got her and Ben through the difficult patches, and then very clearly alludes to knowing Peter's true identity, something confirmed by the end, but this moment, to me, makes it pretty clear. Are you honest with her? Does she know the real you? It's very similar to that one scene with Aunt May in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2, my favourite scene in any piece of superhero media of all time. I could make a whole video on that scene alone, it's brilliant. Peter is saved from that conversation though by a news report that the Sable truck carrying Devil's Breath has been broken into and he rushes off to the scene. The device remains but Devil's Breath is gone. Yuri comes onto the scene and across the water we can see explosions coming from the prison on Rikers Island. So far the raft is secure but all hell is breaking loose. This begins one of the most memorable set pieces in the game, which is no wonder that it was another that featured as a demo pre-release. The sequence in Rikers is intense and large scale. The amount of enemies you're fighting at once, the amount of locations to zip between, the chaos is on full display here and it's brilliantly executed, but it's just a setup for what follows. The raft is no longer secure, which means all of Spider-Man's worst enemies are getting free. We begin with Electro knocking the helicopter out of the sky, which Yuri and Spider-Man barely make it out of. Following Electro into the compound, we have to fight our way through tons of inmates. I do need to know the lore of these red guys though. Who are they? Why are they red? Why are some of these guys blue? Like, what happened? I, I get that it's a supermax prism for like, super villains, but like, what did these guys do that make them super and not just regular guys? Does does being red qualify you as a super villain? I don't know. Dispatching these guys, we make our way to the top of the stairs where we're greeted by Rhino. Oh, hi, Rhino. Ah. Hope you like surprise, Spider. Ah. Surprise? What is he talking about? Making our way through this parkour path, which I really struggled with for some reason, we meet villain number three, Scorpion. Just trapped in a prison with every criminal I've put away behind me. <laughs> this is too good to be true. Scorpion, can you hold on a minute? I was in the middle of a phone call and it was business. At this point, things are really starting to heat up. The tensity through this set piece grows the longer it continues. They just build and build, adding and adding constantly as we go. You feel the struggle here that Peter feels, this race against time to put right a situation that is getting more out of hand by the second. It's glorious. Chasing Electro to the top of the building, we emerge outside, swinging to catch up as the building collapses around us. Explosions everywhere as Electro darts away, almost luring us. The spectacle of this is incredible. Closing in, we finally nail him down, but before we even land a single punch, Vulture swoops in to carry us away. Villain number four. We're going to have so much fun! <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, that's pretty funny. Back on Electro's tail, we swing, zip, and duck out of the way of obstacles, zipping through all of these crates at the last second. Fuck, I hate this. We chase Electro to the top of the tower, avoiding the waves of golden lightning until we emerge at the very top. All of them appear one by one, Electro, Vulture, Rhino, Mr. Negative, and Scorpion. Spider-Man fighting all five at once is such an incredible scene, and I remember watching this demo live at E3 and just being blown away by what I was seeing. And it still holds up all of these years later. It's a moment that earns what it does. Patience really is key to a scene like this working, and patience is never better executed than the final reveal here. After Spider-Man falls, these five villains working together is too much. He crawls to the edge of the building, looking for an escape, but as he does, what has been building for the entire game finally is revealed. The true antagonist of Spider-Man 2018, Dr. Octopus. <laughs> First and final warning. Stay out of our way. This scene is chilling and intimidating in equal measure. The tragic story of Octavius always allows for that specific feeling, but like I said, it works because of restraint and patience, but also misdirection. The entire game thus far has had the plot focused on Mr. Negative and Devil's Breath. Otto has been this character on the side that has been slowly and gradually built up, but not focused on. The core plot so far is really nothing that new. Spider-Man has fought these types of villains before with their secret evil plans. Other than the death of Officer Davis, the stakes haven't been that high. This moment is where the game shifts gears, where Peter has to face something he's never had to face before. It's a defining moment in the legacy of Spider-Man, and where he'll have to learn the most important lesson he's had to learn since Uncle Ben died, and discover a new perspective on his responsibility. It's over, Norman. Time to give them the truth. Hey. You okay? Yeah, fine. Can you, uh, can you pass us out for me? Sure. May is struggling. This is the first sign we get that she isn't okay. Adding urgency to our mission as the player to put this right and find a cure for the sake of a character that means a lot to Peter, but that now, this many hours in, means a lot to us as well. Devil's Breath has been infecting the city for 24 hours, and Spider-Man is nowhere to be seen. Although, just now, he has run away from the hospital, as there's work to be done. The city at this point is a complete war zone. There's rubbish all over the streets, far more crimes on account of the escaped inmates, and Sable has increased their presence in the city. This alters the way you interact with navigation and side content. Often Sable will fire at you while you're swinging, causing you to have to do a quick dodge, disrupting your flow more greatly if you mistime it, and so you'll have to be on your toes to keep your momentum flowing during swing sections. You can't just swing around as you have done the entire game, as every so often you'll 
have to wake up and dodge. This can be annoying, but the real positive here is that it's only relegated to this particular section of the game. Once the game is over, it doesn't continue, and so I actually like it for that. It doesn't dampen gameplay for the rest of the game, but it does create a sense of challenge and danger during this segment, which is totally tonally necessary to marry gameplay and narrative. It's a good choice. You also unlock new zones to conquer at this stage in the game. Little forts that have been created by escaped prisoners. It's effectively the same as the demon hideouts and the fisk hideouts, only harder. And I'm aware I never really mentioned the demon hideouts, but they're like the, the middle difficulty one. They're like the, the fisk hideouts, but they're a little bit harder. And this, these ones, they're the harder than that. So th there you go. And I can't lie, these really do throw a lot at you. It's glorious when you overcome it even more so. I also did want to touch upon the Sable Outposts because that's another thing that gets introduced to the game. I'm not sure when it is, it might be previous to this i think it probably is or it might be after because they do put new york city into quarantine and enact martial law the interesting part about this is that i'm not sure quite how to tackle it because it does change contexts when you enter the dlc and you learn more about silver sable as a character you learn about her backstory it changes the way that you view this but in the context of just spider-man ps4 i'll talk about this more in the DLC video that I've posted to Patreon. I think Sable works as a commentary on how private military organizations can very quickly become fascist, or that they're predisposed to be. You see multiple times over they're locking people up, they're exerting power where they shouldn't be because they are able to. And while of course yes, the quarantine is for the betterment of the people, obviously New York had to be quarantined in this situation, it doesn't mean that they had to do the things that they did here, kicking people out of their apartments to make it a military outpost, locking people up because they just want their stuff. And so I don't think Silver Sable herself has a mandate to overstep the boundaries of what they're supposed to be doing within the city. I think it's more supposed to be a commentary on the fact that this is something that can and will happen when private military organizations get involved in wars or societal matters or allowed free reign on the city by the government itself. This is not just a commentary on private military organizations or the interference of military within societal affairs. It's also a commentary on Osborne himself and the government's willingness to allow things like this to happen to the people they're supposed to protect. This part of the game really puts you to the test, keeps you on your toes and is deeply rewarding to beat. This sequence from here until the end is the true Spider-Man PS4 slash 2018. You know what game I mean. Everything before this, while engaging and rewarding in its own way, was building to what happens from here on out. I think what's interesting is that on a replay, a lot of the prior stuff, while having moments of greatness and meaning, is mainly pretty bog standard to replay. But it's this part of the game, when the stakes rise, when the gameplay and story become deeply entwined, that I really found myself falling in love with this game again. That's not to say that the rest of the story or game before this was boring or bad, not at all, it's still really fun, but I think this stretch of the rest of the game is the bit that really starts to feel special. It's interesting because I didn't feel this way with Miles Morales. I feel that game paces itself better, and while it does build up to the ending, on replays, the earlier stuff doesn't feel as much like preamble setup for the story, it just feels like the story. And that's a total simplification of things, as this video clearly explores that everything prior to this moment has deep meaning and significance, but it might just be more so how it's threaded together that can feel lacking compared to this sequence of the game. Probably because the first two-thirds of this game are all bound together by the concept of a mystery that once you know the answer to, you lose a crucial element of that narrative. Not enough that it falls apart because you have plenty left to observe, invest in, and feel, but I think you lose a driving force, that being the mystery of Devil's Breath and the Demons. Let me know your thoughts in the comments though, I'd be interested to hear what you think. This is where we have to work together to put the Sinister Six back behind bars, being Electro, Rhino, Scorpion, Vulture, Mr. Negative, and... Dr. Octopus. We'll talk about the specifics of the fights in a bit, but first I want to talk about one of my favorite scenes from this section of the game. After helping Yuri with a couple of precincts due to Electro and Rhino's antics, we get multiple calls from Miles and MJ. May is stuck inside of the Harlem Feast location, the Veteran Center, and it's burning to the ground. Spider-Man hustles over there as fast as he can, as fast as we can. 
The sequence is tense and chaotic. We've been dealing with some great foes, and amidst that, we're hearing Aunt May might die. She's in danger. What do we do? We have to save the people of the city, but once they're safe, we need to make it to May. Now, before it's too late. The tensity of this is just executed flawlessly. Miles went in to try and help May while Peter was on his way. Again, a perfect characterization of who Miles is, putting himself in harm's way to help others despite having no powers of his own. Peter enters the building, calling out to May in pure desperation. May! There they are, not in a good spot. Peter webs the wooden floor that's slowly crumbling away as Miles helps May up. Aunt May, you right? I also really love how Miles calls her Aunt May instead of just May. There's something about that that I just really love, it's so endearing. MJ shows up just in time to help Miles and May over to the window to get out of the building, while Peter uses everything he has to keep the floor from collapsing, but with every second that ticks by, their end draws ever closer. Now MJ jumps in. Her, Peter, and Miles are all in this fire together to save someone they care about, to do what's right as time quickly runs out. May gets across, but as she does, Miles falls. She turns back wanting to help, but Miles tells her to go to get to safety. Both of them are heroes, wanting so badly to save each other without even so much as a second to consider their own safety. MJ ushers May out, but now Miles is the one in danger. He gets to his feet and jumps to MJ, but as he does, the floor that Peter was struggling to hold gives way, his energy is sapped. He struggles to move out of the way of falling timber, sending him sailing down the building that's been torn to pieces. Barely conscious, Peter sends up a web, a web soaring up through the fire, reaching out to find something to cling onto, a web that would have missed its mark if not for Miles Morales' quick reflexes. Miles saves Peter. At this moment in the fire, all three of these characters, MJ, Peter and Miles, are inextricably bound to one another. This is the moment the game has been building to, character-wise. The moment that solidifies the arc these characters went on, alone and together at the same time. It's a classic trope, an ancient one, something I've talked about previously, but fire is used as a catalyst for enlightenment and rebirth, and it's no different here. These three are reborn, and their stalwart connection from now on is what will help them to win in the end. It's fucking beautiful. This is Spider-Man, a hero, reborn. I also think there's more here though, and I'm sort of glad to be making this video before the launch of Spider-Man 2, but Miles saving Peter when nobody else could? in a moment where he couldn't even save himself. To me, that feels like a character moment that will be revisited thematically using the symbiote in the sequel. I can't know, and this could obviously age like milk, so I won't spend long on it, but I have this feeling in my gut that this moment will hold a lot more emotional weight as a piece of foreshadowing, intentional or not, to the outcome we'll see when, potentially, Miles is the one to save Peter from himself when consumed by the symbiote. There's been a lot of people saying I'm, like, reaching with this reading, which, I mean, doesn't really make sense because that's the whole point of, like, a literary reading, is it's, it's interpretation based on your subjective viewpoint, but, like, regardless of that, I'm not trying to say that this was their intent all along, that when they wrote this scene, they were like, oh, let's, let's foreshadow the symbiote conflict. No, no, no. I'm saying that thematically, this scene and what it represents for our characters will be revisited thematically in Spider-Man 2. That's what I'm saying. And I think it will add to the scene. And even if it's not intentional, it still adds to the scene, at least from my own interpretation of events. And I think that's really cool. These guys are now working together, a fully realized team with no guilts or regrets, a team that have each other's backs, it's a great fucking vibe. Once they're back on their feet and united as a team, we take a trip to where Devil's Breath was released, which, after doing some Witcher Sense tailing, takes us to Otto's secret villain lair, from which he concocted his plans and carries out this operation. The interesting part about this segment is how much depth we received where the main villains are concerned. Otto has united them all by offering them things they deeply want, the driving force for what incited them becoming villains in the first place giving Martin Lee medication for his condition, which was caused by Norman's experiments, freeing Rhino from his battle suit, working on a cure for Vulture's spinal cancer, criminal records expunged for Scorpion, and helping Electro reach his goal of becoming pure energy. The interesting thing here, though, is that where other criminal masterminds would lie and manipulate, Peter discovers evidence that Otto was capable of each and every promise, or at least close to being. He wasn't lying. 
He genuinely was going to help these people, and in doing so, it would actually benefit society, because by solving the problems of each and every villain, they would get a fresh start, or would cease to be villains entirely. Otto is a deeply intelligent man that despite his recent actions, does deeply care about other people. He easily could have lied to them, they wouldn't have known, but he didn't lie, because he wanted to help. It adds a level of complexity to not just Otto, but to each and every one of the villains that we are fighting. Everyone in this conflict is the way they are because of societal issues, which is what I feel is just so interesting, not just about Spider-Man, but about this version of Spider-Man. These aren't just horrible, mean villains, they're people who have fallen into this way of being due to circumstance. It's an exaggerated depiction of reality. Vulture ends up a criminal trying to cure his cancer, needing the money to do so. Electro, a victim of his own addiction. Martin Lee, someone who was used and cast aside by the rich and powerful. These villains are allegories for those in society who are unable to help themselves, who are manipulated, dismissed, or left in the streets to die. The real villain of this story, truly, is Norman Osborn, or at least he represents the true villain. Corporate greed, government corruption, elitism, he stands in his ivory tower as a direct opposition to Aunt May and the work she does for the lower class of New York. And I think the biggest issue here is that it's never confronted by the story itself, or at least not directly. And in a way it can't, because despite the nuance existing, it's right there in the text, you can't spend a Spider-Man game justifying domestic terrorism. Often stories like this establish nuance, yet don't do anything with it, because doing so would be far too deep and will require unpacking incredibly sensitive topics like why someone would decide to bomb a public place or assassinate a government leader outside of just being deranged and evil. Black Panther is a great example. Killmonger has such a good point, but it becomes mute when he wants to commit genocide. The writers need to avoid exploring his very deep and valid views on systemic racism by making him the next Hitler, because then Black Panther can be the hero and defeat him and there's no questions asked because he wanted to kill millions of people, and so you would never really have to unpack his viewpoint despite there being validity to why he felt so angry at the world. The same is done here, but I do think think it's not quite as egregious, because it does constantly reinforce that Norman is a bad guy, saving him sucks, but Spider-Man can't let anyone die, it's what he does, and so you're left with a very real moral dilemma. Otto is right, but due to the fucky brain stuff that happened because of his tentacles, his moral compass is skewed and his decisions become erratic, working with other villains who are already incredibly far gone to reach his ends of stopping Norman from hurting people. Otto and all of the villains are a victim of circumstance, trying to claw back what they can as hard as they can. Peter is no different in that regard, and it's what makes his firm moral compass so interesting and inspirational, but it's also what makes these fights hold deep emotional weight outside of the personal stakes. It's a direct conflict of two people who get shit on all the same, they just fight back differently. Whether Peter's stance of just dealing with the shit he's dealt is really a good message or not, I like that the game at least tries to confront it somewhat. I suppose the best way you could retroactively make this even better is if Spider-Man 2 starts with a focus on Peter trying to potentially find information on Norman Osborn, something to put him away for good, without him needing to be a supervillain for that to be the case. Maybe MJ is the one that's on it to begin with, so they did learn something from the events in Spider-Man 1, because then it would be that, yes, they all had a point, Norman needs to be put away, through means that doesn't harm human life, through means that works within the boundaries of the law for the best outcome, which will be to put Norman Osborn behind bars, in which case you then can condemn Otto and his Sinister Six at the same time as condemning Norman and having Peter go on a character journey to get there. Who knows whether that will really happen, but that's something that potentially you could do to give this even more depth and nuance, which would be really interesting. After falling into Otto's trap in the HQ and fleeing just in time, we end up attacked by Vulture. Are you okay? What's happening? <laughs> Traffic's rough. <laughs> Dude, that gets me so bad. I, why the fuck do I find that so funny? I, I, it's such a stupid joke. It's literally just for the audience and nobody else, but it just gets me, man. Fuck, Jesus. This brings us into our first proper fight with two of the Sinister Six, Vulture and Electro. 
Like most of the bosses in this game, it relies heavily on using your webs and gadgets to stun the boss, so you can get in close and land attacks to pull up a finisher, with some fun little cinematic moments sprinkled in to make you feel a lot cooler, like by destroying these generators Electro uses to gain more power, opening him up for an attack, or with Vulture where you do these slick dodges to retaliate with an attack that leaves him open. The fun, for me at least, comes from the fact you're juggling all of this at once. You have to continue to keep yourself airborne whilst dodging incoming attacks from both of the bosses and trying to get in stuns on them when possible, and so when you combine all of these different mechanics, you end up with a fight that, while simple on paper, feels pretty damn satisfying to pull off and engage with. And like every fight in this game, on harder difficulties where failing to dodge at the right time could mean failure, you have to be constantly alert, stringing together your moves, dodges and finishes with gadgets to come out on top, and I genuinely find this one really fun. I think it uses all of the strengths of the game to create something both challenging and enjoyable to overcome. After taking them both down, Peter grabs Vulture's earpiece and has a little chat with Octavius. Electro's been grounded. Spider-Man, I presume. If you really cared about this city, you'd be helping me expose Osborne for the criminal he is. By killing innocent people? I would have restored the power. You're sick. You need help. I have all the help I need, and we will not stop until Norman gets what he deserves. What I do like here is that this reinforces what I said earlier about Otto. He insists he would have turned the power back on. He only wants Osborne, and this is his means to get him. That said, obviously he did unleash Devil's Breath on New York, which is sadly sort of unforgivable, and so you do lose a lot of nuance in that sort of half act of genocide. It makes dissecting parts of his character tougher, because where there is nuance, it's often second to the fact that well, he did let loose a killer virus onto every innocent person in the city, which he did do, and so it makes it a little harder to be sympathetic towards him, even though he still does, in a lot of ways, remain a sympathetic villain. Scorpion is up next on our list of encounters with the Sinister Six. This sequence begins when Scorpion injects Peter with his poison, causing a whole series of hallucinations. Most of this manifests as an obstacle course where you try to avoid falling into the poisonous acid and the scorpion tails that will swipe at you. But the interesting part of this sequence is the bits in between, the bits where Peter is forced to do some amount of self reflection on who he is, but also on his relationship with Otto. I also have no actual footage of the hallucinations themselves because I was speedrunning these bits like an idiot, and after searching for hours I couldn't find a single full game playthrough or all cutscenes or movie version that let this play out in full either, until I found my absolute saviour, MWF508. Dude has the only version of these hallucinations that I could find on YouTube without commentary. And for that, he deserves everyone's sub and view. Roll on down to the description, show him some love for being the one who truly bailed me out here. It's just the hallucinations intensify. You can get through this. Doc, you sound... Like I did before the neural interface affected my mind. My obsessions were always there, but the interface allowed me to fully embrace them. I have to fix this. Fix you! Somehow! Ah, uh, Peter. Always trying to shoulder the responsibility, even when there's no hope. I can't tell you how many times your unfettered optimism has kept me going when things look bleak. I'll miss being with you. I really will. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes, yes, you're sorry. And yet, you let it happen. Makes one wonder where your priorities lie. I mean, if I was really that important to you, why would you let me destroy myself? I can help you. It's the neural web. It's affecting your mind. You mean the neural web you helped create. The hard truth is, you did this to me. With your help, I would have never done any of those terrible things. I should have seen what was happening to you. Never left you alone with those arms. Good luck. I wish I could offer you more help. Stay strong, Peter. 
Peter's uncertainty about being able to save everyone, about his own responsibility, is getting twisted and warped the more he pushes on. These, obviously, are the insecurities in Peter's mind manifesting as Otto. This inner conflict is being presented in this way to better convey the emotions he's feeling and dealing with. We know Peter couldn't have known this would happen, but he can't shake the fact that he feels it's his fault, that he should have done more, that he failed to save his friend. Peter's trauma over Uncle Ben lives with him. It's what pushes him on, but also what often breaks him down because he won't always be able to save everyone, and that's something he has to learn to live with. You're too late, just as you were too late to help me. This isn't you, Doc! Ah, but it is me. The me polite society found inconvenient. The parts of myself I suppressed. But you helped me break those chains. I'm sorry. I'll find a way to help you. I swear it. Stop deluding yourself. You never help anyone. Poison isn't in. You are the poison. Everyone you touch suffers. Stop running from me. Let me try. I want nothing from you. You're a failure at life, love, career. You bring nothing but pain. No, stop. I'm not giving up on you. Just talk to me. I can help you. So you can treat me like all the rest, containing me, suffocating me? No, I will let my genius shine on its own. I saw you, Peter, taking notes, stealing ideas, a rat in my own lab. I am your friend, Otto. Please! I've always supported you. I always will! You supported me by selling my ideas to Norman, by sabotaging my greatest works. Don't think I didn't see. Don't think I didn't know. Please, Doc. Please. This one is a bit more upfront. It's still playing into Peter's insecurities, but it's a lot less self-inflicted. This hallucination has Peter defend himself, almost fight back against those harmful and anxious thoughts that his mind is creating, allowing him to separate Otto and Doc Ock in his mind as two different people in a sense, the one he let down and the one who betrayed him not the same man, despite the fact that it is. The final battle with Scorpion doesn't give us much to dissect, you just take him down, kill yourself and move on, but what this sequence allowed for was some deep introspection on why Peter feels the way that he does, what truly was and wasn't his fault, and the breakdown of who exactly Otto is. A man who always felt inadequate, who was threatened by his illness and who wanted to do great things but was beaten up at every turn by uncontrollable factors. So when he got control, when he got power, his goals don't change, merely the means by which he achieves those goals, and this segment allows for Peter to come to terms with that and straighten out everything that he's been thinking since the raft. This is very clearly shown by his next conversation with MJ, asking her when she thinks it's okay to give up on a friend. When is it okay to give up on a friend? Oh wow, Pete. Thinking of Otto? That obvious, huh? Yeah, understandable though. The high-minded, generous part of me wants to say, never. Being a true friend means being there, even when people lose their way. But with what Otto's done, I just don't know, Pete. I guess you have to decide if the Otto Octavius you knew is still in there or not. Maybe if he was ever even in there at all. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, MJ. I gotta process some stuff, I think. Peter still needs time to think this through, and still ultimately believes, as he always does, his friend is still in there. He can save Otto, because admitting to himself that that isn't the case isn't an option. He split his memories of Otto into two people, refusing to see them as the same person because that allows him to have a chance of bringing his friend back. The same line of thought is what ultimately allows him to defeat Otto by the end when all of this flips. Seeing them as two people allows him to forget the friend he knew and do what he has to do to save the city. But we'll get to that. Heading back to Feast, May is very clearly sick. Again, raising the stakes further because now Peter knows too. Didn't you tell me something once about accepting that I'm human just like everyone else? You and Ben. <coughs> Masters at turning my own words against me. 
I love this moment. Just another to add to the mountains of Peter and May moments that get me good. But also, learning May is sick is the push Peter probably needed to stop fence-sitting and to decide what needs to be done. What Otto has done threatens May, and he needs to be stopped. This, however, leads us into yet another mile segment. He's out searching for antibiotics. What was supposed to be a quick pickup becomes a scavenger hunt through tons of armed convicts and the looming threat of a certain rhino. Mechanically, I actually quite like this sequence because it almost takes cues from Resident Evil, which I made a video on recently. You should go and watch it, please. Thank you. Rhino acts as the horrible big bad following you around as you try to silently navigate this area to complete a task without being seen. Obviously, it's nowhere near as genuinely scary as Resident Evil 2, nor is it meant to be, but I can feel a sense of inspiration here that elevates the tension of this sequence in a way that I really genuinely love. On a narrative level though, we get yet another example of Miles being a hero, risking his life to do what he believes needs to be done, to get the medicine for the people who need it, something Spider-Man would do something his dad would have done. After grabbing the antibiotics and escaping just by the skin of our teeth, we get another of my favorite Miles scenes. Get off me! Just give us the wallet! Give it us, man! Help! Hey, leave him alone! Miles can't stand by and see someone getting bullied, being harassed, being assaulted. The performance here sells it. He knows that he has to get this medicine back to Feast, and so he ignores it, but his instincts take over and he says no. He just has to intervene because he feels it's right, and in doing so, he can finally put the moves that Spider-Man taught him into action. In reality, they'd probably both just clobber him and wouldn't have given him that chance, and even if he did land a punch, they'd both certainly gang up on him and kill him. But regardless of that, in this world, it's believable, and acts as a very strong character moment. Plus, you've got this great line to close it off. You want a taste? Nah, I'm good, kid. I gotta work on my fight banner. It's one of those lines that's, again, obvious foreshadowing that Miles would become Spider-Man. If it wasn't obvious yet, it's obviously obvious now. It's time, though, to head and defeat the LGBTQ icons of the Sinister Six, Rhino and Scorpion, a wonderful old married couple. A disclaimer, they're, they're not actually married. To my knowledge, they just remind me of myself and my girlfriend. We're also not married either. She's definitely the Rhino. Where the Vulture and Electro fight, I feel, is a strong display of the game's mechanics, this one's just sort of fine. It might be the setting, it might be the time of day, it might be because it doesn't have the cool electricity effects or an aerial basis, but it just feels a bit lackluster. I almost feel like it should have come first and have the second fight be Vulture and Electro, so it's escalating in scale and spectacle. I don't know. This fight has us use the environment to stun Rhino and get him hit, a trick he never learns from, and with Scorpion, we just shoot him with webs and deal damage. It's pretty standard. I don't really have much of anything to say here. It's just like, fine, it is cool, we, we dealt with them. A little force together time might help you boys learn to play nice. Following this, we begin yet another MJ mission, but it is hands down the best one. If every MJ mission was like this one, I don't think I'd really have as much of an issue with them. I'm of course talking about breaking into Norman's penthouse. The building is on lockdown, thanks to Devil's Breath, which makes it the perfect opportunity for us to break in. MJ needs to head into the security room to unlock the penthouse elevator to reach his apartment room. On a side note, I have always found penthouse elevators kind of terrifying as a concept. Is that just me? Like, the idea that someone from the lobby could, theoretically, just take an elevator right into your home if there was a malfunction or, or, or if someone in security was dodgy. Like, dude, that's insane. At least have the elevator go up to, like, a locked, regular door that you have to open with a key. Maybe I just don't really trust technology, but that idea always freaks me out. Not that it's an issue I'm ever going to face in my life. If I had the money that I could afford a penthouse apartment in New York City, I'd, I'd probably just go live out in the countryside somewhere and build a ranch or something. Raise sheep, ride horses, you know? Although, then there is the problem of being so far from civilization that someone could break in, kill you and your family and sheep without anyone knowing. I think I have some sort of anxiety disorder. We gain our last upgrade for MJ here, an upgrade that actually allows for you to be aggressive in your playstyle, a style of stealth gameplay I've always loved. Despite enjoying the methodical patience of stealth, I also enjoy when a game gives you the tools to just dispatch a whole room of guys in seconds flat without being detected. Like, 
Arkham or I've heard Dishonored lets you do that, but I'm yet to play it somehow. This MJ sequence is like the closest they get to doing that. And while it's not incredible, it's sure way more fun being able to just get behind guys and do a ton of takedowns in quick succession. I do love it. Getting into the penthouse, it's obviously clear we'll have to do some gaming soon because of these randomly strewn around boxes and carts. Like, I can see what you're doing here, game. I'm no spring chicken, all right? We surmise we need to get into Harry's room because the hidden keypad code is the date Harry left for Europe. It seems Chekhov's Harry's Europe trip gun is finally cocking its hammer. Is that, is that a, is that a gun term? Did I make that up? Looking around for the code is always funny because it's the classic, oh, people write down reminders of their password, which is also a personal date or something. For me, I always make my password a random combination of words to throw off potential hackers, like fucking pineapple mortgage 53. I mean, nobody's guessing that. Oh, wait, and getting into Harry's room, Chekhov's Harry's Europe trip gun finally fires. Uh, man's not in Europe. He's, unknown to MJ, in a green tank covered in ooze in the next room. Devil's Breath works as a wonderful setup for the sequel, using the mystery of Harry as a hook. There's depth added to this with little things you can find around the apartment, like pictures of Norman's wife, or the letter of her diagnosis, which is a catalyst for Devil's Breath in the first place, trying to save Harry from the same thing that killed his wife. Oshdoran Syndrome? I think is how you say it. In real life, it's a rare heritable neurological disorder with other organ systems involved as well, especially the liver and the sympathetic nerve system. It can lead to symptoms affecting cognitive functioning, psychiatric health, movement control, the liver due to fatty infiltration and hyperplastic nodules, abnormal adrenal gland functioning, and other issues in the nervous system and immune systems. Unfortunately, there is no treatment available that's able to cure the disease. However, medical treatment of the symptoms is possible, but needs to be custom tailored for the individual patient. Thanks to the Eternal Vortex on Reddit for that one. That's his summary, not mine, because I'm not that clever. In Harry's room, we can very rudely read Harry's journal. We need it for the code, but you can also choose to just sit and read the whole thing, which is pretty fucked up. And I do wonder if in Spider-Man 2 we'll actually confront the fact that MJ just snooped through his personal journal without consent. It seems a bit of a fucked secret, you know, like fair enough she needed the code to save the city, but she didn't have to read the whole thing. Part of me feels like for this to not be a super weird hanging thread, they do need to confront it in some way. Maybe learning that is what causes Harry to feel more distant from Peter and MJ and lean into darker thoughts and really become Venom. Who knows? They could also never address it, which is what I expect them to do in reality. Heading into the lab to get the info we need, we're met with a bunch of glass incubators containing genetically modified spiders, one of which is the spider that bites Miles, turning him into Spider-Man. The interesting thing here is we aren't given total context for this, and maybe for good reason. It's implied that Norman is trying to reverse engineer Peter's powers and recreate Spider-Man. Although, is he? Are we sure he wasn't doing this experiment long before Peter became Spider-Man? Is Oscorp spider research the reason Peter became Spider-Man? I don't think we know enough to definitively say what these spiders are for or how long they've been here. I personally think he's just trying to reverse engineer Spider-Man's abilities, but there's no actual confirmation one way or the other. So what do you think? The other thing in here is an important piece of information that ties together Norman, Otto, and Lee, and sort of puts the pieces together properly. Lee had some sort of psychological condition that Oscorp seemed to believe they could cure. Norman, however, was using it more as an excuse to test an early version of GR27, which caused Lee to become Mr. Negative and in the process killed his parents. This trauma caused by Norman Osborn is what created the man we know today, almost two different people within one body, the good side of Martin who founded Feast and held the party for May, and then Mr. Negative, the side who wants Norman gone at all costs. It's sort of a parallel to Otto too, as well as Spider-Man. This whole game has the theme of duality throughout its characters, both for our heroes and our villains. While Peter works to unify his duality with his companions, his villains allow theirs to rip them apart. Escaping from the penthouse in one of the coolest escapes MJ possibly could have pulled off, we make our way back to Feast. But it seems MJ has picked up a stray. I can't possibly imagine having a giant tarantula looking fella on me and not noticing, but I mean, hey, she's clearly stronger than I am. This scene works as a wonderful conclusion to the duality of Peter. He has allies that have his back. He doesn't have to do the Spider-Man thing alone anymore. He has MJ, he has Miles. This is the perfect culmination of everything we discussed with regards to his duality across this video. 
You are not alone anymore, Pete. Let Miles and me look after Feast. You... you find Norman. You find the cure. Thanks. Partner. Finally, with everything very much in place, it's time to head to Oscorp lab to find Lee and get the anti-serum to cure everyone, which will likely be harder than it seems. The demons have Norman inside, and Lee is after the serum. After a tussle with Sable and a short team-up moment, which I don't care about because her character is bland, we make our way in to find Lee and the serum. Lee grabs Peter and sends him into another dream sequence, one that allows Peter into the fractured mind of Martin Lee himself. This sequence has a great narrative focus in that we now understand why Martin Lee is the way that he is, and so we can connect far more with his motives and actions, despite ultimately condemning them. Lee feels completely responsible for what happened, but he was forced to be because Osborne refused to be, and that leads him on a quest for revenge. He is haunted by his past in a similar way to that of Peter. There's an understanding there, a desire to break through the hate and violence and appeal to the man within Mr. Negative. You're more than your past! Don't let it control you! Lee, though, is too far gone at this stage. It's difficult, but Peter will have to fight. Trying to take back the anti-serum from Lee sends us into our final fight with him. It's not a battle that has enormous scope or scale, but it has a lot of narrative and emotional weight. It follows a pretty similar pattern mechanically to the previous boss encounters, with it revolving around dodges and well-timed stuns with gadgets to land blows and take him down. At the midpoint of the fight, Peter still tries to break through to Martin, encouraging him to fight his demons. <laughs> so dumb. But he refuses, transforming into a giant big demon boy that we have to defeat in order to stop him. This is where the fight shifts gears a bit to be slightly grander in scope. Along with fighting Mr. Negative, we also have to contend with these little zombie guys who, I assume, have to be a representation of the souls Lee has sent to the grave, the weight he has to bear because of his own actions. A lot of this portion of the fight is mechanically the same as before, although at points Lee will turn into a giant demon, which you have to avoid while throwing objects at to dispatch and return Lee to normal human form so you can land real attacks. This part of the fight, I would say, is mechanically very fun. It does what all the strong Spider-Man bosses do in that it combines your ability to dodge with your ability to combat foes, stay airborne and fling objects all at the right times. The strength comes from juggling tasks, and it becomes a lot harder also when your fucking controller runs out of battery mid-fight for fuck's sake. <laughs> Defeating Lee, we get the closest thing we have ever seen to a condemnation of Osborne from Peter himself. Uh, uh, Osborne needs to pay. I know. <sighs> But this is the wrong way, Mark. But before we can see where that conversation goes, Otto arrives, casting away the anti-serum and throwing Peter around like a ragdoll. The sheer violence, rage, and brutality here just adds to the villainous aura of Otto at this stage in the game, and cements him as a force to overcome. The way Otto stands tall over Peter after beating him, holding him in his claws and taking the serum, Otto is lost but he is also incredibly powerful. This is the perfect stage set for the final confrontation. After Peter has hit his lowest point, we have to overcome that. Otto takes Norman and the anti-serum and leaves, taking him away to Oscorp Tower, as Peter lays motionless, bleeding, and is taken away by Sable back to May's feast shelter. I need to speak to your head doctor. There's no doctors here. Well, who's running this place? Me, mostly. Oh, okay. Well, it's been a while, but I'll do my best. I'll need masks, uh, gloves, right. whatever you have to sterile. Peter is gravely wounded. This is the classic low point before the heroic victory, but despite knowing he'll win, the tension is palpable. MJ tries to help him, but all Peter cares about is May. We cut to her in a hospital bed, hooked up to machines, they say she could go at any moment, and so Peter, despite the injuries, despite his mental and emotional torment over what's happening, immediately heads to leave without saying a word, because May could die, and he can't let that happen. Not again. It's his responsibility to try. I don't know if I can beat him. 
Maybe you can't. Maybe Spider-Man needs help from his friend Peter. What? Peter helped build those arms, remember? If anyone can find a weakness, it's him. Peter gets up, the music swells, and that's how he wins. Not with brute force or by being Spider-Man, but by using who he is as Peter Parker. It's the best way to end a game like this, on a journey of nothing but duality of these two lives. When they intersect and cause damage, the best way to win and to triumph is to find unity within yourself. Spider-Man wins by being one with Peter, not by being separate. And of course, after a game of restraint, MJ caps off the scene with her signature line. Go get him, Tiger. But here, we see the spider that has been on her for an uncomfortable amount of time is on the move. It descends down to where an unsuspecting Mars Morales is doing his best to keep Feast together, and when he is least expecting it, the spider finally bites Miles, and after a game where his arc has been about trying to live up to the heroics of both Spider-Man but especially his father, this is the moment where his superhero journey begins. But that's, like I've said, a whole other video, and I did make a video on Miles Morales when it came out. I'll, I'll link it below if you want to give it a watch. It's not as big as this, but I, I do still really like it. I did want to make a much bigger video before Spider-Man 2, but with how long this has taken me and with Spider-Man 2 just around the corner, I might not get that chance. But it doesn't mean I won't make one at some point, because odds are, I will. Heading into Otto's old lab, whoa, fuck, sorry, I just got jump scared by the new Peter Parker face. Dude, as much as it doesn't really bother me that much, I still never expect it, and then when I see it after ages of not seeing it, 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 it almost is a jump scare to me. Like, oh, damn, I, I forgot you look like that, if I'm gonna be honest. Here, Peter builds his final suit, pretty much battle power armor to go up against Otto so that his arms can't outmatch him. This suit, as well as looking incredible, is also thematic unification of the core duality of this game, for both Peter and Spider-Man, but also for Peter and Otto. Peter helped build the arms, and that same tech will help him enhance his Spider-Man suit to defeat Otto. The suit and the arms, both Peter and Otto, will go head-to-head -head in a battle of ideals, of brains, and of power. It's hard to feel sympathy for Norman. As fucked as this is, at least here the only victim is a billionaire megalomaniac who destroyed tons of innocent people's lives. And sure, so was Otto, and that's why he needs to be stopped too. But Norman did it in his desire for power and wealth. Otto is doing it because he feels there is no alternative. He's trying to improve the world by removing Norman from it. I can't even really be mad. The biggest goal for me here isn't defeating Otto, it's getting the serum to save May and the city. That's my motive as the player, as I'm sure it is for everyone else, which I think is the intent here. Peter saves Norman and heroically makes his way up the building as we see a snide smile from Norman. Even now, all he can think about is how Otto is about to get what's coming to him and he gets off scot-free. Fuck that guy. Give me the anti-serum! Otto, you've worked your whole life to help you. Please. You're fighting the wrong man. But I have it your way. And finally, the battle begins. This fight is superb, genuinely superb. The narrative weight, the emotional resonance, the visuals, the music, and all of it comes together for this brilliant crescendo of a fight that the game has been building to, that all of the arcs and themes have been leading to. Mechanically as well, it's a very fun fight. 
it plays into all of the things that I stated earlier in the video, allow the game to shine. You have the mixing of gadget usage with well-timed dodges, using environmental objects as projectiles to stun the enemy, keeping Spider-Man in the air during the fight to avoid damage being dealt from the ground, and you have to keep this up for a while. It's somewhat of a marathon. You need the stamina to keep the loop going for the duration of the boss fight, and it's easily the hardest in the game. Multiple phases just acting to make it tougher as you go. When you're able to dodge all of his attacks and retaliate, it feels incredible. The satisfaction of having mastered the combat system is what makes this fight such a joy every time. Once the main fight is over, with Otto throwing everything he has at Spider-Man, he crushes Pete's web shooters, meaning there's no falling back on webs now, and this high up, that could be fatal. But what follows is the start of an emotional climax that doesn't end until we fade to black after the fight. I mean, let's just watch this scene. Such a disappointment. Parker. You knew? I tried to warn you, Peter, but you didn't listen. You knew? I won't let you win. <laughs> This means too much to me! Not more than it means to me! Every time. This gets me every single time. Realizing that the entire game Otto knew. He knew Peter was Spider-Man and he still did everything he did nonetheless. The way they frame these two in the confrontation, from Peter being low with the camera angled up to see Otto behind him, to the end with Peter up high diving down to deal a blow to Doc Ock. The power shift is clear as day, but what's also shifting here is how Peter views Otto. He believed until the end, until this moment, Otto could be saved. He learns here that Otto methodically and consciously betrayed him, betrayed his trust and that crushes him. The guttural loss of control and the way Yuri Lowenthal performs this scene is heartbreaking, and this is where the duality that Peter has created for Otto in his head flips. Like I said before, he now views this man as a monster, not his friend who needs saving, which allows the switch in power within this fight. Peter isn't pulling his punches, he's not holding back, he's devastated, and that's what he uses to win this fight. As the battle shifts to the side of the building, we have this gorgeous camera angle as Peter weaves between Otto's attacks and deals counter strikes. It's just directed beautifully. This is something that could be in a Spider-Man film. It's something I bet they wish they'd done in a Spider-Man film. Peter tries to destroy or remove the neural link to the armors but fails. Otto impales Peter with the claws and in a moment that seems like it could be it for Spider-Man, he pulls a move that allows him to gain the upper hand forcing the claws deeper into his shoulder to get the leverage he needs to reach over and pull out the neural transmitter, allowing him to free himself, sending Otto hurtling down the building. <laughs> and then what follows is the ultimate emotional climax of this game, of the whole story. This final conversation and well, I'll, I'll just let it play. I saw you as a son. I should have known you'd turn on me, just like all the others. Turn. Turn. I've worshipped you, your mind, your conscience, wanting to help others, the way you never gave up. That's because men like us have a duty. A responsibility to use our talents in the service of others. Even if they don't appreciate it, we have to do what's best for those beneath us, whether they understand it or not. No, you're wrong! You are everything I wanted to be! You just threw it away! Yes, of course, you're right, Peter. Oh, I see that now. The neural interface affected my mind. But I can fix it. We can fix it together. If you'll help me. Do everything I can. 
I'll make sure you get the best help. No! If they put me away, they'll take my arms! I'll be trapped in this useless body! Please, Peter. That wasn't me. You said you'd never abandon me. You promised. Remember? And of course, you rest easy, knowing your secret is safe with me. You do what you think is best, Doc. It's all any of us can. Peter? Even when it hurts like hell. Peter, where are you going? Peter? Peter! This scene is painful and brilliant. It's Spider-Man through and through. It's the raw human emotion that makes us connect with a character like Spider-Man, a character like Peter Parker. It's beautiful and it's harrowing. There's a moment where Otto talks to their responsibility to do what's best for others, and it's a point of great emotional contention for Peter. The way Otto says they have an obligation to do what's right for those beneath us. The camera flicks back to show the reaction of Peter feeling frustrated that something he's made, his central morality system, is being used against him as a method of manipulation, unknowingly, of course, to Otto. This conflict is something Peter has never really had to go through before, where in the comics and the films a personal battle like this is often one of the formative moments for Spider-Man in his early days. Here, it's the first time Peter has ever had to contend with a conflict so close to his heart. That's why, like I said at the top of the video, this game and this story, while being about a Spider-Man eight years into his career, explores the central themes of a Spider-Man origin story and gives this version of Spider-Man a major event that shapes him moving forwards into a new era. The way that even at the end, even after all of this, Peter is willing to help Otto. He's willing to forget it all and give him a hand until Otto leverages his identity. And Peter realizes it's manipulation again. He doesn't know where Otto ends and Doc Ock begins, and so he leaves, even though it hurts like hell. But that major emotional climax doesn't end at Otto. It also carries into the next scene. May lays in the hospital bed. She won't last long without a cure, but Peter only has the singular serum. He can either use it to save May, but damn the city, or he can sacrifice May and have them work on a cure using the serum to save everyone in the city. It was always obvious the choice a true Spider-Man would make here, but it doesn't make this scene any less gut-wrenching. You're gonna be okay, ma'am. I've got the cure right here. Take off your mask. I wanna see my nephew. You knew? I've known for a while. I never wanted you to worry. I did. And I am so proud of you. And Ben would be too. All the people you've saved. I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. And in this moment, Peter truly becomes the hero he's been trying to be for eight years. This sacrifice of his only other living relative, the person who was his mother in every way that matters, is what is the conclusion of not just his arc over this game, but of the last eight years that we haven't seen. Peter lost Ben because he was selfish. He had to give up Aunt May because he was selfless. This scene here displays Peter as the antithesis to Otto. After all of his hardships, all of his struggles, both large and small, his loss and his pain, he remains good. He remains a hero. It's not a coincidence they parallel the you know moment here as well. Everything that made Peter Spider-Man from Ben's death, he gets from May in life, which makes this sacrifice all the greater. But with great power comes great responsibility.
At May's funeral, we see May and Ben together again, in death. It's sad, but it's beautiful too. The two people who made Peter the hero he is, and by his side, Miles with his hand on Peter's shoulder, and MJ holding Peter's hand, as the game, pretty much, comes to a close. Okay, so that was all incredibly heavy. Let's web up some loose ends here, as the game doesn't actually end on that scene, but I thought it was too good of a chapter ender to not be somewhat of a conclusion. The first scene we get before the end is of Otto in the raft. He's coming back for sure. When? Who knows? Maybe not in Spider-Man 2, or maybe he will. I mean, I don't really know, but I think it's obviously implying that he will return down the line. The final scene before the credits, though, is Peter and MJ in Nick's, three months later. It's not a huge scene, it's no final swing, but what it is, is real. It's the emotional core of Spider-Man PS4, the humanity and the people that Peter surrounds himself with. Peter and MJ have been distant this whole game, and one of the core arcs was them coming back together, so to end on them in their favourite date spot, talking things through, solidifying their partnership, and Peter staying with MJ, is a positive, hopeful, and lovely close to this game. This is a superhero property though, so of course we have our post credit scene. You've got the cute one with Miles hopping to the ceiling to show Peter his powers and the smile on Peter's face as he realises there's someone else just like him. I love this scene, I love this moment, and it of course sets up things to come in Miles Morales. The final post credit scene is of course the setup for Spider-Man 2, where Norman takes Chekhov's Harry's in Europe gun and fires it three more times for anyone who didn't notice. Harry is in a tank, covered in what we can only assume to be the symbiote. The origin? The reason? We don't really know yet, but it's one hell of a setup. And not to do the meme that everyone dunked on on Twitter, but of course, we have the green light foreshadowing Norman's eventual return as the Green Goblin at some stage down the line. Spider-Man also had DLC. It was... um... Well, it was... Uh, editing James here. Um, I've played the DLC since writing this part of the script, and it turns out I was I was actually wrong. The DLC is actually good, and my memory had failed me. For some reason, when it came out, I didn't like it. I didn't vibe with it. I didn't think it was very good, but upon replaying it, dude, it actually is good. It's not, like, one of the greatest things ever made of all time, but it's still pretty good. So just disregard everything negative I say about it from here on out. And if you want to see my video exclusively to Patreon on the DLC, head over to Patreon. That's where you can get it. I didn't want to make this video too long or fuck its pacing by delving into a DLC that I thought was pretty bad. So instead, I made a video on that and posted it exclusively on Patreon. So if you want to support me in creating stuff like this and want a little extra content, that's there for all you guys on Patreon. Link in the description. Marvel's Spider-Man, I think, is a game that, while of course being a love letter to Spider-Man from a team that understands every fine detail of the character and mythos, it's also not just that. It's a well-crafted video game in every aspect. It's gorgeous, it's fantastic to play, it's narratively strong and paced immensely well with dialogue that feels natural and oozes subtext. But I think the most important part of this game is that while it certainly makes you fucking feel like Spider-Man, it does one hell of a job at making you feel like Peter Parker. Thanks for watching. October 15th, 2023, 23 minutes past 7 
p.m. Thank you everybody so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed. I worked really hard on it. It was difficult to try and get it out before the release of Spider-Man 2, which is just around the corner as of when this goes up. Huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters because I wouldn't be able to do this sort of thing in such short notice to such a quality without you and while also losing a sponsorship at the same time. So if you want to support me further, obviously a like, a subscribe goes a long way. But if you want to go that step further, maybe just click on Patreon, have a little look to see what I offer because there's plenty of stuff over there and like I said, the DLC video on Spider-Man is exclusive to Patreon. So that's something to look at too. In terms of the future of content creation, I've talked a little bit about my goals or aspirations for 2024 over on the Jazz Lounge podcast, which is also on Patreon. I'm going to be changing some things up, uh, sort of altering the, th the way I focus on things, my priorities, but overall the goal is to have higher quality videos on more interesting and diverse topics. Because I've learned this year that um, a lot of stuff that I make, the, the, the stuff that seems to do the best is the stuff that I really am passionate about, that I care about. Um, there seems to be sort of a correlation there. So I think that's a big focus for me um, moving forward. And, you know, on, on, on top of that, I, I think I'm just very happy with, with the, the stuff I've made this year on the whole. I'm, I'm really, really pleased with it. The reason I'm talking like it's a bit of a wrap-up is because I don't know if I'm going to make another large project this year. Um, this one kind of killed me, and they take so long to make that I kind of felt like I need a bit of a break. Work on um, the second channel, work on streams, um, just sort of chill out for a little bit. I'm sure I'll make a video on Spider-Man 2 when it's out. I'll do a trying to process like I've done in the past. But beyond that, I don't have any prospects for large projects for the rest of this year. But I do have a lot planned for next year, so that's something to definitely look out for. That said, there could be stuff I post in you know November, December. There could be little 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 video concepts that I just think up and I'm like, oh, I'd love to make that um, because I can't help myself but make things. It's just what I love doing. Um, but again, thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Um, let me know what you think about Spider-Man 2, just on the horizon. It's coming out in a few days now. And, um, yeah, don't forget to like, subscribe, all that YouTube shit. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see you soon in the next uh, audio log that you find scattered around the house. <clears throat> Was this bit funny? Was that a funny bit? I don't know. <laughs>